Hello and welcome to the Game Informer Podcast. I am your new host, Ben Hansen, and I'm joined with a lovely bunch of people. We also have Andrew Reiner. Hello, Ben. Jeff Cork. Hello. And Tim Turry. Hi, Ben. Hi, everybody. And as some of you can see, uh, we have changed things up a little bit by adding video to this. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hello. And if you're listening to us through iTunes or any other means, feel free to check out Game Informer's YouTube channel and you can actually see our pretty faces and see the games that we're going to be talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. It yeah, it should be fun. So we have a lot of fun stuff packed into this first episode. We are going to have an email section. So we will be addressing reader feedback as often as possible. Right now, we want to do it every week is the plan. Yeah. And the email address there is podcast at gameinformer.com. And you could win question of the week. So make it a good question. Don't be right. like, hey, what is your favorite Mario Brothers game? Don't make it that. 17 people asked us that this week. So we had to give question of the week to one of those, but it you is. understand how it goes. It's a good topic. What do they get with question of the week if they win it? Uh, we're going to send like a little uh, a little care package oh. with, with some goodies. I am not locking down what is in that care package. The saltines um, and a road flare? Yeah, it's right. <laughs> it's basically my roadside emergency kit that I haven't taken out of my trunk from the winter. So that's what we're going with. Perfect. Uh, be sure to stick, uh, stay around for the second half of the show where we have an interview with Warren Spector as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I think he reveals some pretty interesting stuff. He talks about a Half-Life episode yeah. that he worked on and some more stuff. So, Like new details on a ditched Half-Life 2 project. Which is, Probably Half-Life episode 3 then, right? You gotta assume. He didn't nail the number down, but people should definitely check that out. Oh, that's exciting. I, it is super exciting. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a good one. So stick around for that. But otherwise, let's get started. So we're going to talk a little bit about new games. Uh, this week, this Tuesday, I saw the release of Assassin's Creed Chronicles China. Have you guys been playing that? I have been playing it. I played it. God bless you, Jeff Cork. Reiner, have you started that thing yet? No, I was excited. Then I read uh, Brian Vore, our right. critic uh, who reviewed it. I read his review and I was like, ah, I think I'll hold off on this it- and have that in that kind of zone where I have nothing to play. Was that a 775? I think 725. Yeah, 725. 725. Yeah. Thanks. And so okay. his main criticism is he thinks it's fun, but that it kind of starts to get repetitive. Oh my God, yes. Uh, by the end. Now, how much have you played, Tim? I probably played the first like three or four sections. There's like little chapters of it. Right. It, you know, it reminds me of stuff like uh, like Batman Blackgate, Arkham Blackgate, whatever yeah. the full name of that was, yeah. where it's like, let's take all the conventions of this traditionally 3D, huge AAA scale uh, series, and let's make it 2D. So, you, you know, you're still sneaking up on people like you do in Assassin's Creed. You're hiding in the shadows. You're using, you know, hidden blades to like... She has actually this cool animation where she'll like do like a one-two on a, ga- a guard. He'll kneel over, and then she'll like kick him in the face with her like blade toe it is a good really good animation and then, like it's blood good. splatters and all has kind of yeah. like this painterly look oh, to it and it's one of those games where before you even boot it up you're like huh i wonder if this has sort of like a motion comic like motion graphic <laughs> comic kind of thing going on and just immediately that is what? that's sewn into all of it <laughs> yeah uh, it's very portable ops as far as yes. the storytelling goes that's exactly what i thought of yeah yeah, yeah. um but it, so in the trailer that I watched ahead of time, they made it seem much more two and a half D. And I've only played like the first hour yeah. and a half or so, but I haven't seen too much of like that dimension shifting Where's yet. Where's that half? Yeah, I need that. Half. I need it. You pay, people paid for that point five D. Yeah. Um. So basically, you can go into like the, there's foreground background, almost like a Donkey Kong Country Returns thing. Okay. But then also like we were talking about like hiding the shot the shadows as the guards patrolling. It almost reminds me of like Blackthorn or like the Splinter Cell. Game Boy Advance game, like you could like, oh boy. you could sidle up against the wall, and a guy will go past, and you can just like Ooh, grab him into the shadows. Right. I mean, the most obvious yeah. example for all this is Mark of the Ninja, the like, most recent one. Yeah, right. playing through it or like playing the little bit that I did. I love Mark of the Ninja. It came out two years ago from Clay Entertainment, but it shares a lot in common with that. Even like the gizmos and gadgets you get for like firecrackers and different ways to like distract mm-hmm. the guards. It's all just Mark of the Ninja. Yeah. But Cork, you're probably the biggest Assassin's Creed fan at this table. Like by default. Probably. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love the series too. Okay, yeah, all right. I play all the. I've played all the entries. Not so a huge it's, fan. It's interesting because they do like cram a lot of the conventions, as you were saying. Like the one that really struck me was uh, the like you have Eagle Vision, of course, but then you have the synchronization spots. So oh yeah, oh right. But That's, on a two D screen, it's <laughs> well. Let me let me describe this for you. Um, you like you go and then you hear you see some cardinals, you know, because she's mm-hmm. really big on red. And then you hit the button to synchronize, and then it just kicks you to this, like, grayed out box. Yeah. With it just like, you can see part of a building (laughs) there. And then when you jump off, it does kind of a, like, the camera pans back a bit and does a, um, like, the haystack jump. A little little 2D haystack. It's like, oh, of course. Here we are again. So Cardinals, what is it? St. Louis? Where is this set? 
China. <laughs> China, okay. And and it's like a trilogy of settings, right? Like there's going to be right. three of these mm-hmm. things? Yeah, I think That's they cool said they're concept. going to like India later. And like it, it, that is the whole, like, my big takeaway from this is it's a cool concept. And in the early stages, I mean, it's still pretty tutorially right oh. now where I'm at, but I'm enjoying it so far. I like Mark the Ninja so much that I think I have some runoff love. It's like, you know, it. at first it's one of those things where it's like, oh, it's cool seeing this franchise in a different perspective yeah. and through like a different game game style. But it gets really, to me, where I'm at, uh, it just feels really linear. Like there's points where it's like, oh, you can go over here or there. You got to do all those things, mm-hmm. but you, you, they're, they're kind of linear by design because the game's a kind of a side-scrolling game. And it does that thing that I, I really don't like in games where it's like, you beat the level, okay, now you unlocked this thing that you know makes it so that you can you know, throw this grappling hook at enemies' faces. But like, no, that's just, I didn't earn that. That's just like the next item I got. Don't act like I unlocked this upgrade. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, there's some cool moments where you just have to go and throw a firecracker at a couple guys, daze them, sneak around. There are cool moments within it, but it's not super satisfying. Um, I, I agree with with Brian's appraisal so far. Are you going to keep playing it or play the other entries, you think? Man, I don't know. Assassin's Creed really doesn't... I liked two a lot. I liked one and two quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't seem to be my bag. I don't know. Yeah, And the addition of vision cones doesn't really turn it around for you. <laughs> yeah, the vision cones <laughs> also look really weird because they're like 2D. Like They see like they're flat 2D vision cones. They, right. They look like... A pr- like they're from like an alpha version or something they don't gel with that game's like hmm. graphic novel aesthetic at all kind of the same as like that grayscale map that you can see yeah. where it just looks like oh this is literally like the gray box for the level designers mm-hmm. wow. and now they're putting it in there. I mean not to that extent okay yeah. <laughs> well it seems too that like the game it scales so small at least what I've played of it so far where doing the eagle vision is just more of like a concession to hey we have to have more Assassin's Creed in here yeah. because right. it shows you like who has the key, but by then it's already like panned over to him and said, this guy. Right. And then right. it shows you their patrol paths, which are left and right. And yeah, you can it turns you, out. You see them. They look over a ledge sometimes that you might be underneath, but mm-hmm. that's about it. Yep. It's pretty shocking though for the stealth genre. They have like a little alert above their head when they're about to turn around, which I don't think I've really huh. seen before. And yeah. It seems like that's kind of the the thrill of the stealth genre is not knowing when those guards are going right. to turn yeah. around. Oh, and their, their, their patterns are like laughably you know, routine. There'll be two guards at like one side of, uh, you know, a screen, uh, one on each side. And they'll like, you'll, maybe you'll see them actually in the middle talking to each other. Like, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll walk Great away, Mandarin. stop. And then within like the same, like equal, equal time, they'll walk back to the center. Oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they saw a lot on their journey. Yeah. They're, they're just like, for. Oh, I forgot when I walked <laughs> five feet away from you, I forgot this one really important thing that happened to me yesterday. Another thing I don't like about your wife. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, all that's missing is the water cooler, but, yeah, um, perfect. But it is set. I mean, we should explain how this is all connected, but it's set in the 1500s and I didn't think it was going to have much of a connection, but then it turns out that the person in those tutorials, like in like the loading screens is Ezio. So this character interacted with Ezio. Yeah, she, man- she mentions getting like a weird, uh, what's their weird god race thing in the Assassin's Creed series? You know, uh, the weird god things. It starts with a P, I think. The Prometheus? Something, that- something like that. That's <laughs> sure. great. But she has like a fragment of it, and she's trying to get captured by the Templars. Right. It's actually a kind of flimsy intro. As someone who has a cursory knowledge of that series lore, she like she shows the Templars that she has this prized artifact and then it's like all right they're sure to capture me now and question me and then i'll go and like disrupt their forces from the inside and assassinate this person but then the rest of the pot is oh i gotta get that thing back it's just like really <laughs> that's the best the best idea you had yeah it's not it it's not really in it for the storytelling yeah i mean but if you're interested in mark of the ninja like gameplay i guess but it's funny like we've done so many assassin's creed covers and i've gone on those cover stories like what revelations then three and four and then unity and rogue <laughs> and there were so many comments Every time we unveil the cover, everyone's like, where's the feudal Japan? Where's the China? Like, everybody wants to go to Asia or at least shake it up from the European right. setting. Mm-hmm. And, and this think, is how you get it. Is it yeah. going to be satisfying for fans? I don't I know. I hope this isn't it. Like, I hope they do do a full-blown Assassin's Creed in, like, China or something like that. That'd be cool. I hope this isn't the only way we're going to get it. Yeah. I, I would love to see feudal Japan. And actually, in an Assassin's Creed 3 video we did with uh, Corey May, who's, like, the narrative director over there, uh, he said that he had a very firm foundation for in his mind of how to get there within the Assassin's Creed storyline. All right. But I guess if they can <laughs> enter a China. magic machine and go to an assassin that's in Asia. Okay, got well, that it. Was especially before <laughs> the series kind of jumped the shark as far as right. the present day storytelling and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. How do you think the Assassin's Creed fan base is doing these days? 
I think that they were rocked after last year, like yeah. considerably. That was yeah. It should Unity have been. Was, it should have been the biggest year for them. They got two mm-hmm. full fledged yeah. games on the same day. <laughs> on the same day, and then one of them was like completely broken until like January. It's like the one everybody wanted to play. Right. I mean, yeah. That's it's just sort of a joke. Now it's kind of a punchline, and they do have like a long ways to come to kind of win win back just like the fact that they can make good games right now toronto's making the next one so it could mm. change things up yeah a fair amount but i don't know i just think of like the big assassin's creed fans in our office and i feel like even they're really losing steam with their enthusiasm for the lore and trying to unravel the mystery and a lot of that was just ac3's ending i guess wrapping things up yep however yeah. satisfying it may or may not have been yeah it's a situation where they clearly need to take a break like regroup right this does, like i understand why they do it because they continue to make money but this is, is i think everyone is just fatigued at yeah playing these gigantic games the developers so, or the players you think? players okay i think the developers are probably tired of playing assassin's creed as well <laughs> <laughs> but for different Max reasons Spielberg really hates it at this point no but I, I think they're great games but they're very big and they're all fairly similar I mean, they're obviously new gimmicks and everything right. that are introduced each time, but they're so similar that you just go, okay, here I am again. So this wasn't satisfying uh, AC China just because it is different for you then? No, that it reminded me of kind of like back in the day if you're like, hey, I want to play it. I really like Tony Hawk. Oh, it's on my weird it's my phone. Yeah. And then you download it. Oh, it's like a weird endless runner thing. Okay. Right. This is not what I wanted. It's like Metal Gear Solid 4 on the iPhone. Yeah. Did you guys ever played that old arcadey crappy version? Mm-hmm. I did not play that. Oh, you need to. It's great. <laughs> okay. You really right. sold it there. Yeah. Yeah. Crappy to great. Phone. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's really shocking with this game that it's not made in the UbiArt engine, which is what they used to make oh, Rayman. Yeah. Like Montpellier seems to be kind of the forerunners for that mm-hmm. engine, but like it is not. And it's, it's crazy. It was made by Climax Studios. And they made like the last Silent Hill game, I believe. Or Silent Hill Shattered Memories, the Wii one. Is that the right one? Uh, Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's that team working on it. They didn't use UbiArt, which is crazy because it's the, one of those beautiful engines, or at least, I mean, they it is. really promote the idea that the production through the artwork pipeline really speeds up. But leave up. Ansel's team alone. Let him work on more Rayman or Beyond Good and Evil, yeah. whatever they're doing. Let him be creative. Don't bug him even with, how do you use the shader in your, your engine? Do yeah. not bug that team. Well, even when he's in the office compared to out helping to run the other studio <laughs> yeah, right. where they're making that uh, caveman game, Tale of the Sun 2, I think it is. That's his lunch break. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. Cool. All right. Any other thoughts on AC Chronicles China? I don't. I think that we exhaustively uh, <laughs> covered every thought I had about it. <laughs> we'll have to do this again two more times. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so do you guys want to talk about Splatoon? Sure. Have you, did you guys watch those test chambers recorded? Yeah, I got my hands on it uh, oh, did a little you? bit at E3. So Okay, uh, great. I know about it. I know what its gimmick is and all that stuff. And it, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, Nintendo swung by the office uh, last week, and then we posted the videos this week showing off the single-player mode and the multiplayer mode of Sp- Splatoon. So if you're curious about either of those, definitely go check them out. Um, but it seems quirky and fun. The soundtrack is absolutely bizarre. I think... Okay. I mean, as strange as the Pikmin soundtrack is in comparison to the rest of Nintendo, Tim, like okay. Splatoon soundtrack is on that level of like, I've never heard anything like this coming out of Nintendo. There was one track that was like a metal song. And there was a bunch of gibberish singing. That sounds amazing. But it actually. sounded like like syllables away from just cursing and dropping F-bombs. Left oh, really? Right. Perfect. Yeah, it was pretty good. I was thinking of like the Lums singing in like Rayman or something like that. Mm-hmm. But you're saying it's more like Joe Pesci in Home Alone? <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> when they he actually, steps on the nail. <laughs> they just had a soundboard of him uh, in the sound yeah. booth. That's how they did it. Uh, but the single player for Splatoon, I was actually impressed by it. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the fans of Nintendo out there are wondering like, okay, new IP, what is this series going to mean for the single player campaign? Like, mm-hmm. what is it actually going to look like? Is it going to be like a platforming game with the creativeness of something like the Galaxy series, or is it going to be just multiplayer with bots? And it's kind of in between that. I thought it was going to be more steering on kind of the bot multiplayer level, but there is some creativity and you're like actually launching yourself Super Mario Galaxy style from platform to platform there. And there is, I mean, believe it or not, it has the Nintendo ability to constantly change things up in like the three single player levels that we played. They're always throwing in new enemies and just weird variations on what you're actually going to be doing. So I'm excited for it. I don't think you should expect like big AAA Nintendo platforming campaign or anything like that. But would you guys play it with like, a gamepad? 
Yeah. But, I mean, did you try multiplayer, like local multi at all? No. I was going to say, it's real bummer. You can't do... It's only two player, right? Yeah, it's two player. And the person, one person can play in the screen, kind of like, I uh, remember like uh, Lego superheroes, how they had that split screen mode where one person's on the gamepad, one's on the TV. Yeah. Uh, it's like that. So one person can play on the TV, the other person is on their gamepad. But there's no real split screen multiplayer, which seems like a real okay. shame for that. Yeah, you know, I almost imagined a kind of like, you know, like, remember the Metroid attraction from Nintendo Land, like that right. sort of thing? Uh, like people busting out, you know, Wii remotes and, and stuff like that. But no, it, but I also do like the thing that like Hyrule Warriors did and Sonic Boom tried to do uh, with like having someone on the gamepad and someone on the, on the TV. That's cool. Yeah. I'm curious with that, though. Um, how does it work with the map? Because uh, when Nintendo was sure. here, they kept talking about how critically important the map was because right. you're able to look at it like you do with a map uh-huh. and it would show what area of the map is covered at any given time where everyone is the catch with that is that the split screen or like local multiplayer mode mm-hmm. um it's not the basic cover the most ground mode it's a okay. one-on-one fight so it's not like you're playing that ah. mode where you're trying to cover as much as possible okay. so the map in that mode which they wouldn't show us but they just talked about uh, maybe it's just less relevant i guess uh it could be but the big news about splatoon that came out recently is that the creator announced that there will not be any voice chat in multiplayer because he wants to keep the community clean. And that the, is, the, it's that a game. Unlike the, the game, idea. yeah. Yeah, unlike <laughs> yeah. the game, exactly. Uh, but it's a huge bummer. Uh, and I think it was really telling that like, when we were playing with Nintendo, we were playing against people back at Nintendo's headquarters in uh, Washington. And just to communicate with them, we had to have a laptop open. And we're like IMing back and forth. Like, all right, you guys ready over there? Yeah, I think we're ready <laughs> over here. And then like trash talking through the computer. And it was just... Yeah. Beautifully ironic. It's like, Nintendo, this is the problem. Right. This is why you need in-game communication. Yeah, it's something that I really hope that they come around to because it's, it like, if, I it, I don't do that too often. Like, even if you want to play by yourself with people online, especially if you're playing with people you don't know, you know, just having to coordinate in some way. Like, I'm going right, you go left. Having right. some way mm-hmm. to do that. Like, yeah. it means everything for the life of your game you think about the the chat in like a moba or something like that and how huge it is to to call out where you're going and what your strategy is like if you can't do that i don't know you, you've pulled out some of the strategy from your game especially which, like you can jump to your teammates at any point right and without being able to communicate you could say guys do not come over here this is i'm being totally ambushed right, this right. Is, i'm overwhelmed just stay away because everyone is here go over there mm-hmm. you can't do any of that kind of stuff i agree and their response to that is well look at the map they'll yeah, tell you everything you need to know about what areas are pushing what areas are receding and it's true like you get a pretty good idea of the overall battlefield but i mean it really i think is hurt by not having that kind of communication yeah just some kind of strategy i mean it's it's right. key in those games even right. even if i'm playing against or with randoms on call of duty every once in a while it's like you're at a make or break point in the match and it's like you just need to get a couple people to this flag or right. whatever mm-hmm. the station and it's critical and, and not having that is a huge mistake. Yeah, for sure. Hey, so on Monday, you guys, mm-hmm. did you know that Insomniac released a new game? I saw like a tweet <laughs> about it. Is it something about like a bull that's in love with a cat or something? Uh, the, well, <laughs> the, the bull works with a cat and the bull is in love with art. Um, oh. I think that's the storyline, but it's called Slow Down Bull. And it's this a weird like a community thing, right? Close to it. Yeah. It's kind of, they built it in development with their community and got a lot of feedback. But the idea is that it's somebody over at Insomniac named Lisa Brown. Um, and they live stream, live streamed a lot of the game's development, which is a really fun idea. And I hope that they built up a decent audience for that. Cause I mean, I'm in love with that idea. It seems like Nuclear Throne is doing a lot of that. And um, Massive Chalice from Double Fine, they live streamed a ton of the development. Uh, but this is a very simple game where you're just playing a bull and you're just trying to collect a certain amount of pieces it's 2d on a map before you get to the checkpoint uh it's basically a two button game and it's really simple i like the art style but nothing else really screams insomniac quality with it Mm. i'm always interested in what insomniac's up to i'll have to check it out that's cool yeah yeah the money's going to a charity as well so it's a it's a cool release and i like when big indies like insomniac are able to do something weird like this so you sound like a monster if you say I refuse to play that. Exactly. I was, I was wondering, <laughs> what do you hate about charity? <laughs> right. Is there right. a one button mode so I can pat myself on the back while playing simultaneously? Yeah, you could probably that... make that work. Okay. Yeah, right. certainly. I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. It's no big deal. Um, but other stuff I've been playing is, has anybody else checked out uh, Pillars of Eternity? Uh, I am intimidated no. to no end by what that game is offering. Like yeah. on top of, because it came out around the same time as Bloodborne. And yeah. I remember Matt Miller, like he basically like was trying to work from home for like a week 
and just crank out this game. And did he put like six, 12 hours a day, 12 yeah. hours a day. And like, how yeah. he was talking like in the dozens and dozens and dozens of hours mode. Oh yeah. Uh, how far in are you? <laughs> oh, you know, like one and a half. Oh, cool. Uh, the old Ben Hansen one and a half. They call it. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. but it is uh, from obsidian. It's a very classic Western RPG. It's harkening back to the infinity engine days, like Baldur's gate and all that stuff. Uh, you know, planes game torment. Um, Cork, didn't you play some of those older games? Mm-hmm. Did you play Baldur's Gate? I think I talked yeah. about that a while ago. Yeah, I played right. the old Baldur's Gate. So, All right. Yeah. Do, do you guys like that format? Oh, yeah. yeah Love sure. it. Oh, but neither of you are interested in Pillars of Eternity? Well, it's like this came out right at the same time as Bloodborne. Right. So yeah. it's like, okay, my focus is on this game first, and then there's this giant, huge, you know, sphere of a planet game like, right. Right, weighing down in on us, and it's like, I'll get to that eventually. Right. But, I mean, everybody that's played it has absolutely loved it, and so I'm going into it. I love RPGs, but it was one of those things where as I started it up, I was trying to think of the Western RPGs I really loved. It's like, ah, I kind of got into Skyrim. It didn't really blow me away. I know that's crazy to say. No, that's the common opinion. I know. No, I it to, really didn't grab anybody. I know. I need to go back to it. I really do, especially like now that I got a new PC and everything. But it's like, outside of that, it's like KOTOR, obviously Mass Effect. Love it. Outside of that, man, Western stuff. Should you play Dragon Age 1? No, I started it. Hmm. Hour and a half. Witcher South 3. Park? Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah, I love yeah. South Park. Definitely, uh, Sonic Land Two, Sonic yeah. Chronicles, Dark Brotherhood. Oh, well, I'm a huge fan of that. On the top, there's of no doubt. Uh, but with Pillars of Eternity, it just feels like I've stumbled into somebody else's high school graduation reunion or something. Where it's like I can tell this is making a lot of people yeah. happy, but it, it's all new to me. <laughs> it's not it's, your nostalgia, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's exactly how it feels. And it's like you can't fault them for it not being the most accessible thing, even though they do a pretty good job of like having text for different stats. And if you hover it over, it'll tell you exactly what everything means. Strength um, is how strong you are. Exactly. But I mean, there are just <laughs> numbers up the butt in this game. It is insane. Uh, and so I can't fault them just because Obsidian, they're such huge RPG nerds over there. And like this was kickstarted. It is the game they've always wanted to make. It's the game a lot of fans have wanted to see. Uh, so of course it's going to be a little bit nerdier than you expect. What did we give it? What were the numbers up the butt? Uh, we gave it a nine two five up the butt. Oh, <laughs> pretty sure. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. But that I, sounds like a Miller review. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's really into up the butt jokes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> won't let him go. Yeah, Cork. Are there? Just what are the her. chances you're ever going to get around to Pillars of Eternity? Uh, very small. Okay, I have so much other stuff to do. Yeah, with your life or in games. A little of both. Make something of yourself. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. I promise nothing. What was the other... Um, God, what was the other Divinity big... Original Sin. Yes, exactly. Like, I played... I, I, I stepped into Divinity for like five minutes, and, and Pillars is reminding me of the sort, sort of like the groundswell of excitement yeah, around both sure. of these games. It seems like Pillars is a little higher because people were acknowledging that Divinity was maybe a little bit more inaccessible for some people. Could be. But man, I tried to play Divinity for like 10 minutes, and I was like... No, I consider myself who, someone who really likes RPGs, but I realize that this is just a layer of complexity that I wasn't ready for at that time. Right. But I do want to give Pillars of Eternity a shot. I think because you got into D and D recently, what last year? Uh two yeah, years I ago? played with Miller on and off. I started a campaign for me and my friends. We only got like three or four sessions in. Sure, but I think maybe some of that love will bleed over into Pillars of Eternity because there is a lot of reading in that game. Like there are no real cutscenes. It's just. Mm. Uh, a lot of text like describing like this character smirks as he looks to I mean, your way. I it just feels like a campaign. In Shadowfall uh, Returns, I sure. really liked the story and I had no problem reading that sort of, you know, really descriptive text and, and dialogue and stuff. So if it's on par with something like that, I I could get into it. Guys, yeah. reading is sucks. It doesn't it? It, <laughs> it does. It is the worst. Yeah. Uh, except for Game 4 Magazine. You know, it's <laughs> on that kind of thing. Yeah. Sounds cool. All right. <laughs> uh, but on the complete opposite side of the RPG spectrum, I've also been playing... Uh, a game on my iPad from the Steven Universe. Do you know that show? Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, Steven Universe. Here comes is, the Ben Hansen. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Is, but it's called Attack the Light, and it's a Steven Universe RPG. Uh, it is the show itself is a spinoff of Adventure Time. Oh, okay. oh I, I have heard of this. Yeah, it's one of the one of the showrunners, uh, artists on Adventure Time went over and created Steven yeah. Universe, and it, I guess the show is popular. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it, but uh, this game was recommended. Uh, and it is very much a streamlined version of kind of like a Mario RPG for your iPad. And it's quirky, believe it or not. And it's it works pretty well. Like it's very heavy on the dungeon crawling aspect, um, but it controls well. Like you're just like swiping to go to the next hmm. panel in the dungeon, kind of like, think of like a Zelda 1 dungeon or something like right. that. Um, but, you know, time button presses for all the attacks. And 
it, it tries to be very funny and it, it has a good sense of humor about it. Like your characters, I know you're probably going to hate this, but they all start at level 9,000 and you work on your way over 9,000 for the Dragon Ball Z oh, okay. kind of meme reference. Got it. Um, and then like when you choose an item, uh, he says like, item, I choose you. Mm. And the characters talk a lot about how this kind of feels like they're inside of an RPG right now. So it's, you're making it sound bored kinda, and now I'm starting to go down. Oh, you're making it sound a little cheesy. <laughs> I don't want to make it seem too meme but like. And you should stop talking. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> but if you like the Paper Mario RPGs and you're looking for something on your iPad, it's like two or three bucks and it's really well animated. It looks really nice. It's just, it's fun to have one of those portable, I guess. Cool. Sorry, sticker star. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, but I don't know. What have you guys been playing? Uh, Tower of Guns. Oh, yeah. And Mortal Kombat. So I've been like all in just like quick action. Like, What is Tower of Guns about? What, it came out for both systems, It's very right? true to the name. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're in a tower, and you just collect guns, and then there are guns in the environment, like turrets and stuff that are shooting at you. Uh, sometimes there's enemies flying around and stuff like that. But the cool thing, it's it kind of plays like an old school, like Doom or Hexen or whatever. Okay. Where, yeah, I got you on board. But... Uh, it's very fast paced, you know, complete movement. You got, you know, the your typical aiming conventions, all that stuff. But at any given time, you can go into a room and there will be just like 50 guns just rapid firing bullets at you. And they're like big physical bullets that are flying slow. Like, okay. like imp fireballs kind of? Yeah. Okay. So you, you have time to move. But the entire screen, it's almost like uh, Ikaruga. The oh, entire really? screen is just like bullets coming at you, and you got to start taking out these guns to clear okay. the room. So, um, so as long as you keep moving, like you're good. Yeah, as long okay. as you keep moving and leveling, you're leveling up your guns, uh, and you're collecting different guns, and yeah. secrets in the environments. Um, it's very cool. It's fun. It's quick paced. Uh, you'll finish a level of the of this tower in a good five to ten minutes. Did Reeves review that one? He did. Yeah, okay. he gave it a pretty positive score. I think it was like an eight. Okay, it looked a lot like Borderlands when I when I walked by. It seemed oh, like really? Really? Yeah, it has that cell shaded kind of look. Yeah, really thick, bold lines. But I I also know Ryan that you played like a little bit of Ziggurat. Yeah, uh, I played if, all the way through that. Actually. Did you? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I downloaded it on Steam not long ago, but is is Tower Guns like somewhere on that spectrum? Yeah, yeah, same thing. Like randomized levels. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. Uh, yeah, very. I think each one has just a set number of. I think it's in like under a dozen yeah. uh, levels. Okay, like for floors the dungeon. to get through. Yeah, and, and it's usually just clear out the rooms of enemies. Yeah. And Ziggurat's more like the Hexen magic Correct. fantasy yep. side of it. Yeah, you're collecting loot and stuff like that. And then there's a cool game called Strafe that's on the way, kind of like almost in that vein too. Like another like procedurally generated Quake 1996 PC FPS callback. Yeah, uh, that has like roguelike elements it's in it. Super fast, right? Yes, it's like I really like that. The mid '90s PC first-person shooter is getting its sort of indie spotlight kind of resurgence. It's so cool. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, it seems like every genre has now gotten the resurgence. Oh, like that, like, si- like what is it called? The, like Silent Hill, PlayStation One kind yeah. of looking. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but yeah, exactly. Like what is what is missing as far as like the old genre that we want to come back, or like the era and the genre specifically that we want to come back. I feel like everything's pretty well covered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even like Mutant League football and stuff right, like that are right. coming back. It's almost like a full circle. Right. Here. Well, I was thinking there aren't that many, outside of like Z-Boy games, I guess, and a little bit of like Child of Light from Ubisoft, but there are not that many big indie JRPG homages. You think somebody would have tried to go for that big ambitious thing outside of Z-Boy games? Uh, there's Dragon Fantasy. Uh, there's yeah, that's two true. Of those. Yeah, um, I feel like one hasn't made like a big splash for like this is the tentpole version of that homage. Yeah, you know? if you loved Final Fantasy VI, play this game. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of shocking for mm-hmm. as beloved as that genre is that it's not really out there. I guess. Yeah, there's you know I think the portable systems still get like their Japanese RPGs, which are still kind of carrying like the 16-bit banner and stuff. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. What about the old rhythm games? Those haven't come back. Like uh, the story-driven ones, like Um Jammer Lammy and Parappa the Rapper. Yeah, I'd love to play another mm-hmm. game like that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Guitaru Man. Those yeah. I mean, fun. Crypt of the Necrodancer came out. Uh, oh yeah, this you week, played that. Which is like, it's not like that, but you know, it's. It, I think a lot of people are familiar with it at this point because it it released in early access last year, and it's like final release is this week. Um, but you have to. It's like a dungeon crawler um, where you have to kind of move in time with the beat. It's like Danny Baranowski did the soundtrack, which is like the Meat Boy composer. Mm -hmm. Fantastic stuff. There's like a metal soundtrack you can switch it out with, another electronic soundtrack Mm -hmm. that you unlock in like New Game Plus, I guess. Yeah. Which is a cool idea for a New Game Plus that new soundtracks is your kind of enticement. Uh, But it's pretty pretty solid. It's a cool concept. I will say it sounded ridiculous when you were reviewing it because you were 
reviewing it reviewing it at your desk with your headphones on and it was just you tapping on the keyboard to the beat <laughs> yeah. in the same rhythm for hours on end. Oh, I was just paging down an Excel document, but I was oh, just like really that into right. it. That's that's what was going Making on. Making the world's greatest ellipses. Yeah. Did it just sound like a woodpecker to you other workers? Yeah. Just, yeah. It drove us all insane. Eventually, I did out. get one of those drinking birds on the table in <laughs> Alien. Because um, that's the only one that exists, right? <laughs> that's right. right. Alien. On my desk. If Alien Isolation is an indication that those drinking birds are just going to explode in popularity one day and they're <laughs> going to be everywhere. But Ryan, did you say you're playing M- MKX still too? Yeah, Mortal Kombat. Love that game. Doing multiplayer with friends. I beat story mode. How is that story mode going through? I want to talk to you about that. Okay. Uh, do you Did you like story mode? I did. Uh, I thought it was ridiculous and cheesy and everything I kind of wanted from okay. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> but just to be clear, I want to talk to you about it more than Ben. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm losing dude, interest. How, how do you like being forced to play certain characters? I guess I got over that when... They did the DC one. I think that's where they really oh, started really? doing that, sure. where it was like you're locked in for three battles. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool because they kind of forced your hand into getting to know these different fighting styles with the different characters. Literally. Yeah. yeah, but you know, when I went against the last boss, uh, I was forced to play a character that I didn't really enjoy. Oh, that's that what sucks. I don't like about it. I was on board with like, I was learning Cassie Cage a little bit and then it's like, oh, Johnny Cage is the first character you play in story. Right. And then it switches over to Kotal Khan, who's like a new kind of mm-hmm. emperor character. I think he's new. Um yeah, I, I didn't so. play. I didn't play the last MK, but uh, and he's so slow and nothing. And I'm just getting my my ass kicked by Aaron Black right away. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. did you just have to kind of grind through? You do. Characters? Yeah, it, it gets frustrating, and that you will cheese certain attacks just to get through it or combos that yeah. you figure but, out. But that's the weirdest thing is that. I've been playing a little bit too, and it gives you the option of skipping every fight in the campaign. You can, yeah. So oh. if you just want the story and you don't want to have to learn these new characters, just skip it up oh. until the character you want to play as yeah. in that one fight, and then keep moving. I, I might guess. do that. I didn't do that. No, you're, I, a, you're I, a purist. Yeah, I, I didn't have too much trouble. Like, there was the last boss, I think I fought five times. And I was starting to get frustrated oh, at that point. But then it was like, oh, they might have, like, dumbed down, did, like, dynamic difficulty adjustment yeah. and dumbed mm-hmm. him down because I whooped him in that next round. And, like, if you picked up MKX and haven't checked out the story mode yet, it is bonkers. It's totally worth seeing, you know. just it's absurd. There's, there's so many cameos and just, like, this crazy fight in a helicopter right out of the gate and Johnny Cage being a ridiculous human being. Um... I just love how how cheesy it is. Like you see, I think it's like Raiden and whoever the dude is with the gray ponytail and the staff. I don't know who he is. Sure. And you know, there was like two instances where they're like fighting these demons and stuff because one of the gates is open, and then it cuts to like one of them's pinned down and then the the demon standing above the guy and then from the back i think Raiden like shoves his spear through him and like cuts him in half right and then they do the same exact shot to introduce quan chi where it's like here comes a demon and like yeah. a green skull bo- bursts through its chest <laughs> right right it's like a cheesy script for like sci-fi tv network yeah but they they're given like a hollywood budget for this so yes. it's like ridiculously over the top lots yeah. of animations things to see really cool effects uh, last, it's a fun ride. Yeah, the yeah. last one I played was Deadly Alliance. Like, I got really into the multiplayer on that. But outside of that, like, I don't know barely anything about the storyline in MK. So, like, jumping into the campaign for MK, MKX, like, holy cow, this is just like a comic book yeah. that's been running for 20 years. And yeah. I love having those classic characters still around. Like, oh, here's Sub-Zero talking to Scorpion still. They're still yeah. at it, everybody. <laughs> and, and this is a good point. I, I know the lore in MK isn't a huge thing, but it is a good point to jump on because it is set 25 years in the future. Right. So you do have that gap where nobody knows kind of what's happened. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, I mean, I was a little bit bummed out. I know, Tim, you were really excited about jumping into Mortal Kombat X because I think we both have this urge because we both really like Smash Brothers and, you know, call it not even a fighting game if you want. That's fine. But we both have this urge to, like, get really good at a new fighting game. I think it'd be really satisfying. Yeah. I know you wanted to with MKX, but how's that going? Uh, It's, I mean, the fact that I can't work through a story mode as the character I want to get good at, which is, like, Cassie Cage, I think, is just sure. awesome. I love her character. Yeah. Um, And her, her moveset gels with me pretty well. But, like, I wanted to be able to enjoy the story mode while playing as her throughout. Mm-hmm. I think I just need to kind of concede that and take her through, like, one of the towers or something. But... You know, when I sat down and like went into practice mode and was trying to just like figure out her moves and like right. figure out, not even look at the move list and just try to figure out what what attacks flow into each other, it was really satisfying. Okay. And I, I still really want to have that enjoyment of like getting to know a fighting game pretty well. Do you think Mortal Kombat X is going to be that game, Tim? I don't know. Because yeah. have you sat down with like a fight stick and tried to do that? Because that's no. way more satisfying. Oh, I bet that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, we kind of have that arcade thing out at my lake lot and right. I'm really hell bent on being really great at Street Fighter 2. By the end of this summer, that's, that's my the mission. game to do it. 
Yeah. Well, Cork, yeah, you're a big Mortal Kombat or uh, Street Fighter 2 fan. Yeah. yeah. I forgot about Tim, that. you got to wait till Jason comes out, the DLC, Jason Cork. Oh, yeah. Just be amazing. That should be your guy. Yeah. I would love that. I, I, want, I feel the same way about the Predator. Like, you really? <laughs> I'm like, eh, it's. MKX. I'll wait until that's available. The sure, moment, I'm the, in. the moment that that, that uh, both of those characters are out, we need to have like a uh, do like a test chamber and do like a video preview of just like Jason versus Predator. Throw everyone at each other mm-hmm. and see which character is better. I think Jason's yeah. gonna be slow, but pretty devastating. Predator is gonna be really quick, have some strong distance attacks, but maybe fall apart in melee. Like I bet range. he's like reptile a little bit. Okay, yeah, sure, that's a good point. That. Like the different pacing, like the different speeds of projectiles yep. and stuff. If the predator doesn't have as his introduction, him emulating the other person, what they're saying with his weird predator voice simulation. <laughs> Another realm says blue. That'd be it. good too. <laughs> while, big time. while at the same time having that sort of infrared thing where it's like scanning and stuff, and then he, he enters. Is that pretty good? That's pretty good. Okay, cool. Yeah. What was the uh, what is Johnny Cage's favorite intro of yours, Tim? Oh, he uh when it's uh Farah and Tor, when yeah. you're playing as Farah Tor, they walk on the stage uh or whatever that you're playing, and you know, it's a big dude with like a little kind of feral kid on his back. Mm-hmm. Um and I remember watching, uh, we watched Road Warrior not long ago because I watched it twice, like around the time that we were covering all the Mad Max stuff mm-hmm. uh, for Avalanche's game. And, you know, I was like, oh yeah, Blaster Master is cool. He's a big dude with like a, like a little person on his back who's calling all the shots and stuff, the brawn and the brains. And like, Blaster Master, that's cool. Or is it Master Blaster? It's Master Blaster. It's Master Blaster is the character. Mm-hmm. Blaster Master is the game. Yeah. So yes. Master Blaster. So anyway... <laughs> So all that, all that is to say, when Johnny Cage walks up and sees Ferritor, he's just like, oh, Master Blaster. <laughs> like, <that's laughs> I just, get the reference that's here. That's all he says. And I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. But I was kind of bummed out. Like, I jumped in to play Mortal Kombat Versus with an old friend of mine. Like, and it was kind of fun in the sense that we're picking up our Deadly Alliance characters. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to be Raiden and Sub Zero. Those are my two mains. Let's have at two this mains. fight from 13 years ago or whatever. <laughs> um, but. I forgot how much of Mortal Kombat when you're starting out is just a bummer because like every time somebody has their characters like okay let me pause it can I pause it here I need to check out my moves list oh every fighting mm-hmm. game ever yeah, exactly and it's so annoying. you have to do it though except you have to. and not I'm not saying Smash is a better game overall as far as the fighting prowess but it's so satisfying to play Smash Brothers and everybody has the same like, move set yeah and you don't need to check any menus because it's just the biggest buzz kill like okay let me pause it let me pause it here let me memorize this what was that one is that down I mean, to the left ideally you'd be each playing by yourselves a little bit and then yeah colliding oh, the worst is having to pause someone pauses so they can do their fatality on you yeah, exactly. like, I, yeah. you're just wasting time just give me an uppercut Right, right. It's like someone's out on your time. It's like if someone's about to like just savagely murder you, and they're polishing their gun before they do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or exactly. revving the engine before they're about to run you over. Asking it, you if you could run and get some wax. That's a better example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Perfect. Uh, outside of that, I've also been playing this game called Bloodborne. Oh. It, hello. Have we hit the first game that everyone's been playing? I don't yeah. think Jeff Cork has started it yet. I have played. Well, here's the deal. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I. Was it was late at night mm-hmm. and spooky? A, a spooky. beer or more okay. fell in my mouth. Oh my god! I'm so sorry. And you'll never believe what happened. I downloaded Bloodborne. Oh, and then I fought a guy, and I fought another guy, and then I hit a button, and my the weapon got long. There we go. And oh, cool. I broke some stuff. Oh my god! And then god. a guy killed me, and I was like, "All right, there's Bloodborne." But that's still pretty impressive that you found your way into the city. Yeah, uh, yeah. I not lit bad. A light, I lit a light. You did. So you're in Central Yarnum. Right. That's you made what it. it felt like. <laughs> Central Yarn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michelob Yarnum Light is what you're... I'm still pretty impressed because that was the big thing for me is I played maybe one hour of Dark Souls 1, two hours of Dark Souls 2, mm-hmm. and I'm up to like four hours of Bloodborne. Whoa. Uh, really wow. going for it. But I always hear this debate online about this game is impossible versus people like Dantac saying, this game is a cinch, don't be scared of it. Dantac tends to, like, he understates things, I think, in a way. I don't know if he's trying to, like, be... He's He is really good at games. So I think sure. that you also need to take all that, but it's, ah, this game's, you know, a cakewalk. Or don't worry mm-hmm. about it. Yeah, I yeah. got my secrets. I'll teach you. <laughs> the shirt's not take so that shiny. With, with a grain of salt, yeah. <laughs> my shirt's not so shiny. Eh, he's got a shiny wardrobe. Yeah, but going into it, I found... Uh, that you just need a little bit of a Sherpa in the beginning. If you've never played a From Software game, like my yeah. friend Grant is obsessed with them and he just came over and it was really like a 20-minute tutorial. Like, okay, here are the basics. Like, this is like 
the hunter's dream you're gonna be coming back here every once in a while this is how you get out of the hunter's dream uh here's what some of these different stats do here's what i recommend for your starting class or stat list stuff like that have you met dan tack our pc editor he's right there i know Me, that's true i can help you i'm trying to say for people out there i think i'm really into this game now and i think it can be really fun if you just get over that initial hurdle right because starting out on your own i would be so frustrated even like when i entered the town it's like I, there, I need to activate a device. I don't know where this is. Sure. What's happening? I mean, there's always something about your first From Software game where it's like you can write off 20 hours or something. Just cookies getting, and cream, yeah. Yeah, just getting used to... I was like 3D Game Heroes. Oh, sure. Uh, just getting used to the rhythm and the, the progression cycle of those games and how brutal they are. I highly recommend looking at the controls <laughs> before you start playing as opposed to the next morning. Mm. And then <laughs> things click, but it's mm. partially like... Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, I, I oh, actually, okay, that's what... I, why the weapon got I had the long. problem of like when I went into the hunter's dream for the first time there's that creepy doll lady and it's like well I remember hearing that this lady will wave back to you if you wave at her so I went right up to her and it's like wave must be up on the d-pad it's like oh no that sapped your life so that <laughs> you can get bullets like yeah. of course it is yeah Ryan how much have you played I'm about six or seven hours in okay uh, and I'm I foolishly thought I could watch Daredevil on Netflix and play Bloodborne at the same time. Oh, no. Uh And I was just like, you know, there's like talking going on in Daredevil and I'm just like engaged in the game. Then also I look over and it's like Daredevil like dying in a dumpster. I'm like, whoa, (laughs) what just happened? Pause this. (laughs) Okay, we're going back here. Yeah. I was like, okay, I watch this for like 20 minutes. I play this for a death. You know what you should do, Reiner? Genuinely, if you want to keep watching Daredevil is with Daredevil, they have uh, basically a version of subtitles, but for the vision impaired it will literally describe every bit of action on that screen so if you turn on that mode you can treat daredevil like one long podcast yeah. and then you can play bloodborne sounds and get like, the full experience sounds like ben hansen's dream come true yeah <laughs> bloodborne is a great podcasting game which is one of the reasons i'm probably going to stick I, with it i would say daredevil's worth watching though sure yeah, yeah that's sure. probably Darede- true. all right it's a big long hallway this guy comes through a door and then a door falls on him and then he sees a guy and- that first episode's deceiving then because you watch that and there's just a lot of talking heads in that episode right a lot of it and i was like okay i think i can do this like i'll when i hear action i'll, I'll look over but i didn't even hear action it was just daredevil yeah. in a dumpster right like, and that's the thing happening? with daredevil that i don't really like is before every big fight scene they do yell action oh, that's <laughs> true. fight yeah. here i go yeah exactly <laughs> it's daredevil time <laughs> uh but bloodborne like it's so bizarre to me that a game that is all about i mean all about being very vague about what you should do next and a lot of repetition can be so beloved it's like those things that we sometimes bash in other games becomes like the celebratory thing well, about this game and it is satisfying to get that yeah repetition down and it's like a training that you've had all your life through video games of like repeating the same stuff over and over again and now you can really take advantage of those abilities it, lo- it loops in almost perfectly i mean what we were talking about getting to know a fighting game like part of that is like having fast reflexes and 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 being better than someone else but mm-hmm. another part of it is just like the satisfaction of knowing every combo for a character when to use them what attacks what special moves you should use against this other type of character it's just knowing it really well and bloodborne forces you to get to know it well you can't fart your way through that game right uh and there's a lot of games that will let you fart your way through it mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. uncharted or uh call of duty or you know you, you can knock these these games down in difficulty and just sort of have a content tour if you want right uh and like bloodborne flies in the face of that and from software games do and it's a it is the fact that it is such a breath of fresh air from that, like the standard AAA game design that I think people love it so much. I was really amazed going into this thing relatively blind, just how big of a swing every fight can have. Like, I'll go into it and it's like, okay, I killed that ogre pretty easily that first time. I'm not too worried about him. Go up to him the next time around, just get devastated. Sure. All because I yeah. was a little bit off. Like, fights can either go really in your favor or just annihilate you. And right. It's all up to what you go into it with. And I'm going to say it's a lot easier than Dark Souls. I've played all the Souls games. Sure. And the big thing, the big thing that that helps me so much in this game is enemies will whittle away at you, right? In in the Dark Souls games. In this game, if they hit you, you have the chance to get that health back. Right. Right. So but you it's don't tough have to remember like, that. You don't have this like really kind of intense relationships with your your health revival potions. Right. Like you feel like enemies are dropping a lot of them for you. Uh, it's like kind of holding your hand a little bit through the opening areas. Where it gets a little harder is where those lanterns are. There, uh, you don't have those in front of boss fights like you did right. in uh, in uh, Dark Souls. They're usually after the bosses, so you can get wrecked by the boss and lose all that progress. Whereas in mm-hmm. Dark Souls, 
it might be a little harder getting to that next yeah. point, but at least you get there with your stuff in tow. Yeah. Even in New Game Plus, you know, you can still blow it and get killed by an enemy that you've you've mastered you thought you mastered and ogre. literally killed them hundreds of times yeah at this and point. then a brick ogre just like smashes your face in and you're just like oh well well that's humbling i forgot oh, or, to be scared of everything or the more frustrating thing where it's like you know father gascoin was uh the big like uh sort of gatekeeper for the game for a lot of people's like gascoin is where cleric beast is okay you can beat cleric beast all right but then there's this crazy priest that will just totally ruin your day in a graveyard uh and I had that that cool like subtle bragging point where I'm like, yeah, you know, actually I got gas coin on my second try. Like it wasn't that bad. Right. Uh, and then of course my new game plus, I threw myself at him for like two hours. <laughs> um, and so I mean I know that the stats change and new game plus makes things harder in a different variety of ways, but the fact that something could have been such a cakewalk the first time through, and then I had to think about that battle in such a different way the second time. Right. It's like I feel like I'm just getting the best of both versions of how that boss fight could have gone gas coin just came, seems like a breath of fresh air after the cleric beast like i have well, like i got gas coin down to like 40 percent oh, yeah i got him down to like 40 percent health though and cleric beast i had to fight so many times and it's the combination of like having that giant guy and also just the camera losing its effing mind did you kill gas coin no no okay, okay. What, what happened when you got him down to 40 percent Nothing. I died. He, okay. He has Wait for many it. He transforms. Faces. Yeah, oh, you're, no. you haven't seen the worst of Gascoigne. <laughs> oh, yet. yeah. I love that. Oh, you innocent little thing. <laughs> oh, man. Because like, it's one of those things where it's like I beat the Cleric Beast, and then I got cocky, and it's like, I'm just going to start running. And eventually oh, ran my no. way, and I found Gascoigne, and now I don't know where I went. I don't know how to get back there. I'm sure mm. I'll eventually know the route through those mermen swamps pretty well. That's but, part of it. Okay. Um, just knowing the route and just sprinting yep. to the boss. Right, right. But that Cleric Beast camera, like... He looks cool, but to start your game after training people to lock on to an enemy, and then when you lock on to Cleric Beast, it's just a disaster. You don't want to lock on to everybody. Yeah, and he's that's one a of boss, boss I wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just don't. That's the kind of thing where you just have no idea. Right. Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, has anybody else been playing anything else, or should we start talking about some big news? Uh, Broken Age. Uh, oh, that's yeah. officially out the whole thing. Well, not yet. It's out next month. Oh, it month. is. Yep. Or next week oh, yeah, okay. is the well, embargo. But you've been playing the first act Yeah, again. I'm going through the first act, and it's... It's lovely. It's fun. It's old school adventure. Yeah. A lot of talking in that game. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I, I love Double Fine's sense of humor and just, I don't know, the, the emotion and thought they put into their games, I think, is yeah is pretty unique mm -hmm. uh, and currently, you know, in this landscape of games. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 oh, go ahead, Cork. I was going to say, I'm learning that we don't like talking or reading. Uh, yeah. Oh, Turns that's out. a good point. Yeah. It's perfect. Two things that just. They don't go together either. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with. Broken Age, though, I'm looking forward to replaying the first part because you have to before you start the second one. Um, and Depending so, on what you're playing. That's true. If you're platform. swipping, swapping systems. You're swipping, swipping swapping. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking forward to because I don't remember that much of Act 1. It's one of those where like, I beat the first part, I think, just like in a on a Sunday uh, years ago mm. at this point. So I'm really looking forward to going back before going into yeah. Act 2. Yeah. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to crank through the first act too i know that even schaefer tim schaefer recommended doing that just to get the most out of it as well so yeah i'm definitely looking forward to diving deep into that with probably you jeff cork next week I'm talking about talk broken act and that. broken agents entire yeah yeah cork did we cover pretty much everything you've been playing uh not really but i been playing lego marvel superheroes again okay yeah i've been playing it with my <laughs> youngest kid and it's okay. actually great because the hub world it feels weird to talk about this game because it's been out forever. Sure. But the hub world is fantastic because he just likes to walk around as the Hulk and pick up cars. And right. Throw Your them. son. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, I'm like unlocking characters and actually accomplishing things. Sure. But we're able to do that split screen and that's perfect. Don't the worry. One day he'll mow the lawn. Oh, oh God, if he's is anything it? like the Hulk, I, just, <laughs> I, plays that. I don't know if I want that. Is this like an anticipation for Age of Ultron or something? Or what made you go back to this? No, nah, it's just kind of like they keep asking about it. And okay. so I, they're like, can we play Lego Marvel? I'm like, let's play Lego Batman 3. Right. No, that's too hard. So huh. Like, ah, whatever. Of course it is. Interesting. Yeah. The coolest thing about the hub world in Lego Marvel that I fell in love with was just being Iron Man and being able to fly from the streets of New York all the way up to the helicarrier. Because mm -hmm. you see it and you think it's just, all right, that's the skybox, yeah. helicarrier's up there. But it's like, oh no, that is one continuous world. And it's so rare in an open world game to be able to fly that high up vertically and oh, be yeah. able to still interact with that object yeah, up there. That's super that was cool. cool. Yeah, and also was really I was fun. playing Ori and the Blind Forest. Oh, I just sure. started playing that again too. Just having a wonderful time with it. It's a fantastic game. I was probably like four hours into it. Okay. And then... uh 
loaded it up, and it lost three hours of progress. Cool. What? To the point where I was I didn't have like a double jump anymore uh. and all this other stuff. So I was like, nope. What are you playing oh, on? Oh, man. So I was playing on the Xbox One home entertainment console Perfect. from Microsoft. That sucks. So then I put in uh, God of War Remastered Edition on PlayStation 3. And just took so your anger out. Yeah. That's okay. smart. That, that game's really awesome. good. <laughs> in case you've forgotten. No, I, I, I loved that The game. first one, yeah, it's so great. I started playing Ori again, too. I didn't have that bad of luck uh, with it. I was, like, in some area. I came back to it in, like, the most confusing possible way where it's like, here's a dead end. Like, oh, no, this is the part where, like, the woods plays tricks on you and shifts around. I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot about this. But I still really like it. I'm excited to, to beat that. Uh, but I did actually go back to uh, Final Fantasy 15 episode Episode Duske or whatever. Oh, the Duske, yeah. Yeah, the Duske. It dropped hey. the Duske <laughs> into the my... Another for Duske? Yeah. Hey! You know what, I, what I'm talking about, Ben Hansen. Uh, anyway, I tried playing that with my friend who is a... I mean, I'm a big Final Fantasy fan, but he's like, this is the console-selling possible game for right. me. Like, I, I want to check this out. And I had checked out this this demo, basically, of Final Fantasy 15 at one point. Like, your first experience with Bloodborne, I had, it had been at the end the tail end of a long night of, of playing games and having a couple drinks and i was like i don't know if i'm in the right state of mind for this <laughs> this is weird uh these guys are really good friends and i i'm just not ready for this this type of you know like brotherly love here certainly uh and then i went back to it just recently i'm like man one the combat system is really really strange um just like the dodging mechanics and switching between weapons they throw a lot at you right away but even just the open world stuff, I don't know how much you guys have played with this at all, but <clears throat> I was doing stuff like that I feel is like so last generation like game design. Like, hey, there's this narrow place and we're hunting the behemoth. So mm -hmm. you can see it in the distance and then you're kind of sneaking through this. The camera pans in. You're kind of sneaking through this little corridor and like the, the behemoths in the background sort of sniffing in the air and stuff. And Sounds cool. You have to get past him. And then they follow that up with a stealth sequence where you... Huh. in. Third person have to sneak around and make sure, all right, well, the, the behemoth's you know, left eye is, is torn out, so you have to kind of favor that side as you're sneaking around him. And then if you blow that, you have to like go do that other thing where you snuck by like very, very linear uh, sort of, I don't know. It's basically, I am super disappointed with the game so far. Wow. They have a lot to do between like this demo and the final product uh, to actually make that game like worth being excited for what about just opinion? running around in the open world i mean it looks so that's, nice that's kind of cool but yeah. what they're project what they're kind of offering as far as like an actual crafted you know hey here's right. here's our story and the way we're going to tell it um there's a part where one of those boss fights where you're destined to fail and you have to run mm -hmm. but i just got stun locked over and over again three times in a row and the checkpoint was way back there so if they they're trying if this is an example of the kind of game played like the game design that they're putting into it i'm i'm nervous for that game they're so like, what about your uh, super hardcore friend? Also really disappointed, a little more optimistic than me. Sure. But he was very frustrated uh, as well. What yeah. about like the characters so far? What do you think of them? Uh, just, I mean, um, anime and JRPG tropes, basically. Yeah, it's they're not offering a lot. It basically, like, imagine walking down like a side street in Shibuya in Tokyo or something like that and just like full on black, like fashion clothes, spiky hair. <laughs> sure. Like, Jeff um, Cork hair. Yes, fashion exactly. <laughs> mi missing a sleeve here and it. Very, very ridiculous outfits, but kind of in line with what you've come to know from like Nomura's Final Fantasy character sure. design. Yeah, yeah. I think we all played a lot of games last week, it turns out. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Reiner, you probably had the most exciting week last week. I had the best week. It tell really us, was. Tell us all about this dumb celebration you went to. Yeah, so I went to Star Wars Celebration in Anaheim, California. It was four days of nothing but Star Wars. 60,000 people, all of like minds, descended upon this convention center just to hang out and talk Star Wars and see Star Wars mm -mm. and spend a lot of money on Star Wars. Sounds terrible. Oh, my gosh. The money part is the strangest thing. Just what a racket that place is. Oh, it is. There's, there are, I mean, I don't know how many retailers are there. Like, everyone who's ever sold a Star Wars, piece of Star Wars merchandise is there. How, how big was the Lego section? It was pretty sizable. Okay. Yeah, you go in there, and it's that's the thing. It's like a, a nice Lego store that's only Star Wars Legos. Uh, oh, a lot of stuff that's out of print and stuff like that. You're oh, like, oh geez. man, I kind of want to get that, but it's like four hundred dollars, you know, like for yeah. the Death Star or whatever. Mm. Uh, but yeah, people just selling stuff for ridiculous prices and people buying it too. Like there was always lines at all these vendors, uh, exclusives selling out in fifteen minutes. Did you buy anything? I bought stuff. This is kind of crazy. Like I had my eye on a bunch of things I wanted to buy for myself, but I just ended up buying stuff for my wife and daughter. Aww. What did you have on your? 
Like, what did you want to get for yourself? I want to get armor. I do want to get stormtrooper armor. Really? To wear yeah. underneath your shirt? Like full on? No, over <laughs> my shirt. What would you do? Put with a that? hoodie over the top of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's the point? It's just awesome. And you just would wear it around the house? Maybe. I don't know. Wear it in the shower? Yard work, get like, you know, like the... Maybe I'd be like part of the 501. C- I don't know. Cut okay. grass in it and get just like flecks of like, <laughs> like lawn mowing debris. All that would me. be me. Like yeah. throwing the drinks in my mouth like Jeff does on the weekend. I'd be out there mowing the lawn in the storm. That's smart. Gear. I think that 501 thing is interesting because... What is the 501 thing? It's a bunch of guys who dress up like stormtroopers. And but- they hang out? March together? They go to all these conventions together, like hundreds of them uh, at each convention. And it's cool because they have the microphones in the uh, the headset. So when they're communicating, you you hear it like just like in the movie. Do they all have TK numbers then? They do. They all have their own numbers, uh, unique armor. They get ranked up. It's kind of like the Boy Scouts. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say more like the Nazi party. When you think about about stormtroopers, right? right. Yeah, like they're siding with a guy who blew up an entire planet is just like a threatening gesture. Yeah, but that armor looks awesome. It's It's like a Nazi Nazi uniform. It's true. They sure know how to dress. Cork makes a very convincing argument, everybody. That's true. But there's a new company that started selling uh, armor and a stormtrooper getup, I think, is like $1,500, whereas before you kind of had to get it all custom piecemeal. Oh, okay. It's not bad, in my opinion. Like, I was talking to a bunch of friends who were there, um, you know, and we were all looking at this armor like, eh, should we do I this? Mean, it's an investment, like a nice business suit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I can wear this to business meetings, to funerals, <laughs> weddings. Yeah, <laughs> weddings. Were there any maniacs there with like uh, chrome spray paint, like after they saw the new episode seven trailer? Like, like there were people in cool. in the actual stormtrooper armor from episode seven. I believe. Oh, it. wow! Like full on armor. People as the new uh, Kylo Ren, the new Sith Lord, right? Uh, as Ray, you know the the scavenger on uh, mm-hmm. Jakku. Are you used to saying these names yet? It's still it's like uh, Rilo, I have to Kylie, think about it a little uh, bit. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Rilo, Kylie. Rilo, Kylie, Wiley Coyote. <laughs> but I got to see the episode seven trailer in the arena with JJ, oh, all the man. actors, and. Um, thousands of fans so people are just losing their minds as this was playing the electricity in there it was like i had shivers the whole time it wasn't too loud though like people were quiet no no so luke starts talking at the beginning of that and you could not hear it at all so they came back out and they're like let's play that one more time but this time really keep it down so everybody was like dead silent for that next one oh wow and like one guy like coughed and he was like killed with a lightsaber awesome uh but no that was cool and then the show ended with you know we got to see battlefront star wars battlefront yeah yeah Um, talk about that the first seven minute slice of gameplay on uh the uh the moon of endor were they playing it live uh, no, it was a video. Mm-hmm. So okay. I appreciate you making that distinction, the moon of Endor. It's like Frankenstein's monster. It's right. important, right. but subtle. It's the battle of Endor, but they're on the moon, Correct. but they're in the space of all around Endor. But sure. um, the So it's the recreation of that, and it looks exactly like it does in the movie. You know, they did set location kind of scouting. So sure. they had the same color uh, dirt, the leaves, all that stuff was authentic. You know, same locations for certain points, too. Um and it looks like a battlefield game, though. You know, like you mm-hmm. kill someone and you get the the kill streak bonus. Huh. The demo was heavily scripted. The guy playing it definitely knew where to look. You know, when the speeders came racing around the corner, uh, obviously they had all this stuff planned out when they're right. doing the the setup for for this this video shoot. Most and importantly, then, how does it sound? It sounds amazing. I yeah, want to hear all what the, the dice team does with Star Wars. Oh, God, yeah, oh, yeah you so hear good. like the ad at you know. There's you finally get to see what the ad at does on on that pl- on that moon. You know, he's, cool. It wasn't just sitting by that satellite dish, and they didn't use it in the I, movie. Yeah, I was having that debate with someone on on Twitter about just like what can these things knock down trees as they're walking? Did they knock down trees as they were walking? No. Okay, so but it was just kind of on this little clearing, and it took like five steps, and then some Y wings came in and took sure. it out. They and it said, looked awesome. They said in like an AMA, uh, somebody working on the game said that the ATATs are going to be on rails, oh, and uh, then you just get to yeah. like shoot. What's an ATAT? I'm sorry, the at at. There you go. There we go. But that's the weird thing. You say a- you say at at, and then ATST. Yep. I say ATAT. I say ATAT. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. That's AT- AT- but I, I hear it both ways. Yeah. My cell phone is actually AT. But it looks really cool. It's mostly got that classic trilogy vibe. I didn't see anything prequel in it. Okay. Uh, and then um, there's going to be a a couple weeks after it comes out. There's going to be a DLC uh, map that is from Force or uh, Telling Crystal the- Skull. <laughs> right. The oh. Crystal Skull. No, they're telling the battle of. Jakku's, and you see that at the beginning of the new trailer with the down star destroyer. Right, you're gonna fig- you're gonna find out how that happens. Oh, so is the so it's not set in the Force Awakens timeline. It's the battle leading up to that. Interesting, on that planet. but it's a battle that happened during the original trilogy's timeline. Correct. Okay, right after this is like the next big 
battle is mm-hmm. after Endor is supposedly the Battle of Jakku. Do you like that there are Jedi's in Battlefront? Yeah. I, I mean, they revealed like that Darth Vader is going to be in there. It doesn't yeah, get... he should be there. Right? He's in the okay. first one. Yeah, but it's always that weird thing of like, oh, and then I guess everybody's going to want to be that character. Like, how does that work? It, it's a power up, at least in the mode they showed us, it's a power up that you pick up. And that power up could give you a rocket, uh, like a rocket launcher. It could uh-huh. give you control of a vehicle like an ATST or an ADAT. Uh, or it could give you control of someone like Vader. Okay. And all those things are kind of like little boss battles, like where the opposing team's going to have to figure out how to take out Vader, because Vader's obviously going to be really strong, right. force push, uh, choke, lightsaber combat. Yeah. But it looked almost on the same level as the trailer they released publicly? Not quite that right. uh, that good. But yeah, it was it was impressive. The visuals, the lighting, especially coming through the tree canopy, was very cool. Awesome. God, I'm so excited for this game. I think, I'll make a bull prediction. What? Does anybody think that this will not surpass the sales of the Battlefield series? Oh, man. Like the highest Battlefield mark? I think Battlefront's going to blow it out of the water. I think it's going to be pretty close to that. Yeah, I'm curious. You got to remember, the last generation had, had had such a huge install base. Yeah, that's true. So we're still kind of relatively early here, but I, I, I could put it over 10 million, yeah. And if you see, like, sort of Battlefield's rap recently, uh, it's been really right. up and down, so. Guys, could this be a system seller? I, I think it's a Dagobah system seller person. Oh, there you go. hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm super excited about that. Is there anything else that really stood out from that convention? Uh, they just they closed it off with uh, a trailer for Star Wars Rogue One. Oh, yeah. Which Gareth Ed- Edwards came out on stage and everybody's like, okay, this is like a meet and greet. He's just going to talk about what they're doing. Maybe we'll learn. Because they haven't started filming yet. Yeah, maybe we'll learn the timing and all that. And, sure. And he just kind of sat down and was like, check this out. And you're like, holy crap. They Crotch just, chop. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like... Yeah. They showed um, something cool from the movie that set up the Death Star. You know, it's, yeah. it's going to be a but prequel to A New Hope. At the same time, right. doesn't that take some of the, the... Like, we just celebrated Dark Forces anniversary, and we know how the Death Star plans were acquired by the Rebel Alliance. Kyle Katarn Kyle got Kyle Katarn, those. yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Nah. Also, like, the Alternate Rebels... history. I already thought that, like, the Rebels storyline was eventually going to go there, and that'd be, like, the way to close that out. I believe they're going to connect. Uh, and then oh, Starkiller really? will meet up with Leia on Hoth. Mm-hmm. Huh. Right? That they has have, to happen. Yep. Is that what happened, or was it Vader? That someone someone meets up on mm-hmm. Hoth in, in Force Unleashed, and it has something to do with uh, Star Wars, like, the Death Star or something. Yeah. Uh, Reiner, I do have a surprise for you. I don't know if you remember this post-it note here from uh, months ago. Oh. But this is... Uh, <clears throat> One lunch bet. Whoa, 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 wait. Uh-oh. Reiner said Star Wars Rogue One is going to star and be about Oscar Isaac's character from episode Oh, seven. come on. Did I really oh. say that? That is your prediction and it is officially nullified and you owe me one lunch for a Rogue One. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have one more Star Wars bet going with Kyle. And the bet is $10 and I'm betting that Hollow Chess is going to be played in episode seven. We're going to see... Hollow chess activated. You're just talking about like certain levels of fan service. <laughs> yeah. Is that basically it? And like, okay. Right. I think that's basically the idea. I think it with Kyle on that one, but I'm not going to bet you. It's yeah. it's a good 50 50 call. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know which way to go. 50 50. Have okay. any people made up rules for that game? Like, are there people at Celebration playing that? Yeah. They use Amiibos. <laughs> Very Perfect. good. Uh, no, I didn't see that. But I mean, I pretty much saw everyone from the Star Wars universe in costume. Like, you know, like char- the sure. people dressed up as those characters walking around. It was one out of three people was in costume, I would wow. say. Oh, my God. Hmm. You know what really bums me out about the celebration? Like, they had a great great, like, great live stream going throughout the entire thing that I would tune into every once in a while. But it bums me out that in that interview, Mark Hamill revealed that BB-8 was practical, that the new droid, like the ball droid, uh, was actually a physical thing. Because, like, imagine everyone's minds being blown if you didn't reveal that and then it just came out on stage. Like, Mm. that would have torn the place down. I mean, I think it was still a crazy surprise, right? Oh, yeah. It was cool to see it. And just, I mean, they were maneuvering on a small piece of the stage, right? Like, four feet and you got R2 sitting there and BB's going right around. Yeah, like, sizing up R2. Yeah, like, like, right on the side of the stage. It's like, wow, the precision with that. And it was fun to hear, like, the sounds that bb is going to be making in the movie. Very melancholy. Right, (laughs) right. Did you see, the? would you say that the precise uh, piloting of BB-8 was uh, as precise or more precise than the blaster fire of a stormtrooper <laughs> more precise okay cool <laughs> way more precise all right great perfect yeah also uh i tuned into a random moment during carrie fisher's live stream and it was literally the second that a fan asked to get his picture taken with oh, her he goes yeah. up on stage she kisses his cheek and then she just goes whole hog and grabs his face rotates it starts making out with this fan yeah brand- Mind blowing, but it didn't stop there. I don't know if the what? camera. I don't know if the camera caught. I don't know if the camera caught this, but as soon as 
after she made out with this fan and everybody's just kind of like, what's going on? Uh, they took the God. picture, but after the picture was taken, she went over to the host and grabbed the host who was doing her panel uh, and went in and like kissed him. And it was like, whoa, this shut it down. And like, she grabs yeah. her dog that was on stage. <laughs> ah, Carrie's out of control. Oh boy. It's, it's fun to see her again. Glad to know she's a little eccentric, but I, is she going to be able to rein it in for the Princess Leia performance? Like, what is that going to be like? She's just the same character. Yeah, just making yeah. out with everybody. <laughs> Come here, Chewie. Han's Come here, like, Luke. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, it was really fun also during that episode seven panel, just how loud of a reaction the practical effects thing got when they mentioned mm-hmm. that. Like, the crowd went wild. Yeah. I, I love it. It was kind of a slap in the face of Lucas. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's also, that was just so popular for so many years. Like, special effects and CG was so overblown to the point that it's like, oh, we, you know, I remember watching this is an aside the dawn of the dead remake and it's like all right and then it cuts to like this headshot of this one zombie and then it's clearly cg and the blood splatter is perfect and stuff and like right. i miss practical effects i miss the grit i miss the sort of imprecision that happens with it sometimes yeah, right and man i'm just so pumped and i don't like disrespect to lucas be damned like i'm so pumped for it Oof. yeah the, the thing that i but really like in hell <laughs> the thing i liked was jj said you know after they f- they stopped filming they had like a cut of the film you know, right. like because they had so many practical shots where that's, you could just see the film kind of unfolding, maybe, opposed to waiting for ILM to get done with a sequence that just was placeholder. That'd right? be one of the reasons that those prequels fell apart. I mean, one of many reasons, I assume. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a pretty long first section. Do you guys want to close her down and get ready for reader emails? Yeah, take a little break. That Let's sounds good. We'll be back in a second. Welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We have a selection of emails that we've pulled from our new email address at podcast at gameinformer.com. Mm-hmm. And readers and listeners and viewers have all written in. Uh, some was kind of input on what they'd like to see from the podcast, which we promise we're reading every single one. Yeah. Um, they say, don't make it narcissistic. Keep it mm-hmm. about games. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. I, I, Wear bags over your head. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. perfect. Yeah. yeah. I saw your online dating profile. And uh, I can't wait, wait to wait, meet wait, you. Wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, and then also... Uh, just a lot of questions about the industry and stuff like that. So yeah. Tim has pulled some of the better ones, and we're going to go through those and then also award our celebrated question of the week. Yeah, yeah. So just to encourage everyone to make the, the, the best of their question. You know, good good grammar is much appreciated and uh, and interesting questions and stuff. But there were a lot of good questions. It was really hard pairing yeah, this Yeah, thanks, down. everybody, for emailing in. Um, also, um, yeah, let's just kick it off here. Sure. So this is uh, this is from Adam from Medford, Massachusetts. Uh, he writes, "Hey guys, first of all, congrats on the new roles as as MCs of the Game Informer show. Talking to Ben and I specifically. Look at that. And basically, that's a tone that was throughout all these emails. Everyone's really optimistic and happy for us, and and hopeful that the, the new show is great. So thank you for all the the well wishes and stuff. Anyway, uh, here's a question for you guys. This is this is Adam speaking again. Uh, it feels like there's been a recent resurgence of games aiming to really challenge players. Whether it's a game that requires patience, like the Souls series, or precision and persistence, like in Helldivers or Ori in the Blind Forest, uh, a game I often find myself playing with my mouth wide open due to intense focus. Personally, I think it's it's great to have games like these on the market, and I hope that they can win over more casual gamers so we see more of them. How do you guys feel about these kinds of games? Thanks, Adam. Uh, it's exciting that they seem to be doing so well. I mean, Bloodborne sold over a million copies already. I mean, for a game that tough to be that popular, it's kind of heartening, I yeah. suppose. Um, the Helldivers, that's the overall thrill, is just how unbelievably tough that game right. can be, trying to coordinate it with your teammates. And it's it's an intentional difficulty, right? Like, it's not just, like, poorly designed balance. Like, it's... Like bullet sponges and stuff yeah, like so that. Yeah, so right. they, they feel fair. You know, all these games feel fair. There isn't yeah. a point where I'm just like, I'm done. I'm rage quitting because I don't think I could get past this. There's always that hope that you can get past it. Right. And you know it's going to feel great when you do it. It's like you blew it and you know why you blew it and you can mm-hmm. get back at it. It's not like, oh, that, you know, Raven respawned in Ninja Gaiden and... You know, I, it knocked me off my platform or whatever. Right. How tough does Ori get by the end, Reiner? It's pretty tough. Uh, I would say what I, I might maybe died on that like 15 times. Okay. But that's all that's like all perfection in your movement, right? Like uh, you died in Meat Boy. You died in Ori only 15 times? At the last section. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you saw the water temple in that one, right? Like the um, first kind of dungeon area they have. You're talking have. about the water escape? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like that, but harder. Okay, gotcha. Oh, fantastic. I think, yeah, like echoing what Reiner said, just it can be difficult as long as it's well-designed difficult. And you brought up Meat Boy as an example. Like that is a great one for me and such a big thing for Meat Boy. And this is a little bit off, I guess, the main beaten path. But I loved 
how the music would continue when you would die. Oh, yeah. That was such a oh. big draw for me is not to have to restart the same track again and again. So it's like, not only do you get like the instantaneous reset, but it's seamless as far as your overall experience of the game goes. Because the music's so exciting that right. it just kind of keeps you in it. And I thought that was a huge, a huge deal. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So, so thanks for writing in, Mr. Medford. Yeah, hey, thanks, Adam. Um, well, he's from Medford. I know. Oh, okay. All right. Um, all right, next one is from Jack from... Uh, San Pedro, California. He writes, uh, first off, best of luck to Matt. May the force be with him on his journey ahead. So, oh, definitely. First episode of uh, the Game Informer Show podcast without Matt Helgeson. So we I'm, already miss you. I'm very sorry that our voices are nowhere near as good oh as Matt. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on it. <laughs> Hip hop reference. Um, okay. My, my question for the show concerns social gaming. Uh, I imagine working at Game Informer, you probably have lots of people to play games with, whether you want to or not. It's, it says that. Oh, uh, do you prefer to play games solo or with friends uh, a majority of the time? Uh, have you always been that way? If you've become a social gamer over the years, is there a specific game that led you into becoming a social gamer? Um, so that's the gist of that question. I like huh. to play alone. Yeah? Why is that? Most of the time, it's because... Um, Multiplayer gaming for me is just like you have to set up an appointment. It's rare that it's like a spur of the moment fun time thing. It's mostly coordinating with a bunch of old people and who have lives and things to do. You know what I mean? So it's that's hard. And I, also, I have a tendency where like if you're playing a shooter or something, I just instantly know when I'm done. And right. at that point, I'm out. And I like sure. like I'll play multiplayer with strangers and everything. Then that's fine. But I don't like feeling as though I'm disappointing someone or like that long ass goodbye that you have to have. And mm -hmm. and then if you're, you look like a, like a world-class a-hole, if something they see you're still logged on and you're doing something else. Right. But that's what it is. I just like, I get to a point where I'm, just, I'm, I am fed up with this, even though we were having a great time, I'm just, I'm ready to go. So a single player pretty much all the way for you. I mean, I played multiplayer stuff. Well, we've, but we've played some, some multiplayer together. Yeah, yeah. I vastly prefer right. single player. But I, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Yeah. I would say I prefer co-op if I can have a good group. Uh, some of, of my favorite of memories. Randos? Yeah, of, of friends. Like some of my favorite memories of the last generation are all from co-op games. You know, yeah. Left 4 Dead, stuff like that. Uh, playing Destiny. Sure. Hanson. Oh, uh, no, don't bring it up, Reiner. I go into Hanson. I, Hanson. I see Hanson's playing the game, so I jump into orbit with him. And uh, he sees I show up in his, in his, you know, my ship shows up behind his <laughs> and he logs off. Ben Hansen so is I, now I, watching I get my Netflix. phone and I was like, what the hell, dude? That sounds so much like a Ben Hansen. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was the equivalent of me desperately trying to worm my way out of a conversation because it's like, oh, I'm going to have to plug in my headset and you're technically my boss. She I just, just wanted disappears. to dick around in this game and listen to <laughs> podcasts. A lot of it was like, now I have to pause a podcast while playing <laughs> oh. Destiny to like make small talk with Reiner for 45 minutes. I, I'm like 100% like kind of in Ben Hansen's camp there where it's like, if I have set out to play some, you know, some co-op that night, like then that's great. But otherwise, like I mostly like make up my mind that like I'm gonna go home and play games by myself tonight. Right. And uh, I like really love that. It's like a, something I've been doing my entire life. Um, and then there's the other side of it that I think I feel like this. I don't like the pressure of having to persistently keep up with the Joneses. Pretty much like take Destiny for example. Right. Like, sure. Oh yeah, you know I can just jump in a match with anyone. But like I just don't want to feel like a burden on anybody there. Kind of like yeah. you mentioned, or an MMO. You know, I remember trying to play MMOs with uh, my best friend Dave, like back in the day, uh, who we call my buddy Dave in the office. Dave. Oh, your best buddy. Dave. I always call him my buddy Dave. Um, but uh, yeah, and and we'd start playing Warcraft at the same time. And I like to play a lot of different games. Dave usually gets like laser focus on one and he would mm -hmm. just go off to the races and you know I'd be playing catch up on levels and stuff and that bums me out but yeah. Yeah. like Reiner says uh, good co-op is hard to beat especially and, like Resident Evil 5 or Helldivers or Left 4 Dead yeah, I love local co-op yeah. yeah local co-op especially but I mean I've kind of gravitated more towards single player or just if you want multiplayer just choosing to play with your friends like some of the best times you will have is getting a group of friends over for like a sure. LAN party on an RTS like that is still like the height of Peak fun gaming for me is LAN party RTS stuff. I it's, love it. That's or really even, good. even something like a Lego game is so much better when you have someone at your side. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they don't know how to stand on a switch and you just <laughs> wrench the controls from their tiny hands. And they're four years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or they don't know how to put the toilet seat down. <laughs> oh, yeah. brother. Uh, okay. So we have Steven from, from Oklahoma City. Uh, hey guys, do you think that with all the directs happening, like Nintendo directs happening throughout the year, that there'll be a time uh, in the near future that E3 has little to no impact? Uh, Steven. 
well, forget the directs. I mean, just think about all the other conventions that are popping up. I mean, there's 16 PAXs now. Right. There's actually one starting just a couple seconds ago. I don't know if you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, hey. I mean, that's just diffusing things so much that, I mean, yeah, it, I think it's not ever going to completely fall off the map. No, I think we also forget just because we look at it as like fans and consumers that, oh, E3, it's for us. But it's like buyers go there. Right. People go there to like actually work on business deals and everything. They, there has to be a central, like, those guys aren't going to go to PAX. But they can They're go not going like, right. to go to Gamescom. They can go to, like, GDC, though. I mean, that seems reasonable, don't you think? I think that's even, a, like, a pretty deep dive for those guys because yeah. there's not really a show floor, per right, se. Right. It's all indie-focused at GDC. And DICE is more uh, oriented towards They need someplace talks. to be, like, Gambit with their business there's cards. A, there's a show floor at GDC, but it's just not quite as robust. No, it's mostly for people who are looking for jobs, though, sure. primarily, so... Uh, the one thing I would say is maybe your typical stage-based, theater-based press conference might be in danger where if you can script your message and not have those moments where there's a guy like Giant Crabs, Massive Damage. Oh, yeah. Good job, Jeremy. Or, you know, those kind Wonder of things. Book. Nintendo, yeah. you know, Wii Music, stuff like that. Yeah, you can focus test your press conference. You can nail it down to exactly what you want your messaging to be. Do you like the pre-recorded stuff like Konami used to do, though? Yeah, I, I think, well, yeah, where you just go sit and watch a video. <laughs> right. No, I mean, that's a waste of our time, right. now, especially nowadays. But uh, no, I think Nintendo's onto something here where yeah. um, if you want to debut something in the best way possible, why not censor it? You know, it's, like have it down to your, your exactly what you want, opposed to taking a risk of your video failing, the guy getting nervous on stage playing. Yeah, sure. And like, I'm totally with you, but like, the consumer with me and like the games journalist in me are conflicted because it seems like we're like middlemen kind of being cut out there. It's yeah. kind of strange to be excited about it and sort of like approaching it from this other angle. But then sure. having the spectacle of the stage and people in the crowd, there's something to that too. There's right. some kind of magic to that where you even just seeing the camera swoop down past all the people right. up yeah. to the stage. There's it's something fun. kind of magical. Hearing about the crowd experience. reaction with like a Naughty Dog logo comes on the screen, stuff right. like yeah. that. But then they just announced today that Square Enix is going to be doing a press conference at E3 this year. Bethesda announced they're going to have one before E3. Uh, seems like more and more companies are getting on the press conference bandwagon. So yeah. there'll still be plenty of big surprises and announcements at E3. Like, I'd be surprised if something topped it as far as announcements goes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, the next one. Uh, George writes, uh, why haven't you had Jeff Marchiafava on as a guest yet? He's my favorite editor and easily the handsomest person on staff. George from not Minneapolis. Oh, wait. It. Oh, it's Jeff um, Jeffem is crossed out right here. <laughs> oh, okay. um, well, whatever. Question of the week goes to Jeff. <laughs> yep, that's it. Uh, okay, Mr. Well played, Jeff. Yeah, well done. Okay, but actually, for real, now we have uh, the the Game Informer Show question of the week. Don't look at me, Tim. All right. Uh, so Chris writes in, "Hey guys, I'm a 30 year old guy. I have a wife, question two mark? kids." Big boy job, 401k, the whole laundry list of grown-up stuff I have to contend with. I am still really interested intellectually in the video game industry. I keep up with the news, follow developers and publishers. I know who bought who and when the most titles are set to release. I even get that butterfly feeling when an awesome-looking game releases a new trailer. The problem is I can't find the interest to play almost anything anymore. It's been over a year since I've played anything to completion, even though I've made several purchases since then. Destiny, Evolve, The Order, Ground Zeroes. I can't even complain that I don't have time. I stay up late and my wife goes to bed early. I just can't get on fire to boot up my console. Uh, any advice in rekindling the flame? Have any of you ever gone through a meh phase? That's from Chris. I'm most curious about Reiner because you've been doing this for so long. Never. That's never I mean, once. insane. Never once. I've, I've always, I just love the experience being immersed in these worlds. And there's so many options today. Like, I feel like I don't have enough time to just scratch the surface now before it was like you could play all the big releases but now i just feel like i'm falling behind on everything well, yeah. on all fronts not just the my wheelhouse but all fronts yeah yeah so you never um, you never get home and it's like uh daredevil's really good maybe i should just boot that up and i gotta get caught up on mad men and then at that point it's like yeah i'm good i'll read and go to bed there yeah there'll be days where it's like i don't want to play a game mm -hmm. but it's never an extended period i, I would say beyond maybe three to four days uh, I, I just get that itch yeah. uh, and wanting to play something and dive into those worlds or be competitive. Sure. Like there's so many different things you can do. Mm -hmm. in games. I think that's one of the problems for me is that there are so many games. I'll like, it's like looking at Netflix and you just finally give up after a while. Like I'll look at my shelves and then mm -hmm. I'll look at what's what I've downloaded and it's just, I'm completely paralyzed by all the options. Right. And it's like, so I just shut it off and right. go upstairs and right. Talk to your dumb kids. 
Yeah. They're yeah. usually asleep by then. Okay, but perfect. I wake them up and talk to them. Yeah, I, I, I have this exhaustion every once in a while. Like, I thought when I started this job almost five years ago or whatever that I would get really burned out on games and at least like thinking about games every day and that hasn't really happened. But there's still been times where I'll go for like a month or two months where I'll just pick up and play a game for an hour and a half and just nothing is really speaking to me. And then I start to get worried, especially working here because like, oh man, our top 10 list at the end of the year, I have to come up with my top 10 games. Like if I don't have like 10 that I'm passionate about, that's going to be terrifying. Maybe I'm just not a cut out for this, but something always comes along if you just experiment enough. And even I'd, yeah. like, I'd recommend going outside of your genre comfort zone. Like, yeah, definitely. Like try out uh, Pillars of Eternity, everybody. Yeah. You know, just try something completely new and really challenge yourself to take a deep dive into something completely fresh. What did you think of the new Madden? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you won't show up about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think I, I definitely, I think I'm somewhere in between what you guys are saying. I think there are definitely those days where like, usually when it happens to me is I've just beaten some huge game that I poured like 60 hours into. Sure. And then I, I, I take the disc out, I put it in the case and put it away. I'm like, okay, I can go and see all those, like get into all those games I've been putting off and been piling up my backlog. And this bottleneck happens where it's like, I don't want to play anyone enough. There's not a clear winner that rises above. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to go watch Netflix. I'm going to go read a book or something. And I think it's, I think part of it is just like an exhaustion from pouring so much time and energy into uh, like one game and stuff. Yep, Sometimes sure. you just need a decompression. But if I was going to give a suggestion here um, to, uh, to Chris, I'd say that um, maybe just exactly what Ben said, which is like, just keep trying. Like, don't give up. For me, it wasn't until like Bloodborne came out this year. Last year had some cool games. What about like Monster Hunter? I think that was Monster Hunter game. was exciting. But I think that like, all last year was like a very up and down, sort of a strange year for it was games. Weird, yeah. It was probably the most debated game of the year that I've been like that discussion I've been part of since I started Game Informer, and so I think that goes to show what the quality of of 2014 is kind of below par yeah, overall. Right. But, but then Bloodborne comes out. It's the most excited I've been about a game in a, for a game for like a year and a half, and getting that once like Chris's sort of spark has been muted for a while, like getting it back feels amazing. Yeah, definitely. So keep going. Uh, okay, so next one. Oh, we had a lot of questions about virtual reality. This will probably be our last question uh, for this segment. But um, so Joshua from Idaho writes, now that we know VR is on its way and it appears to be pretty solid, what type of games are you most excited for? Uh, like in a perfect world where it works perfectly and immerses you in a game as if you had actually been there. And uh, Joshua references like finally being, being a X-Wing pilot in first person as being his dream. Sure. So yeah, yeah, that's up there. What do you guys think? I think he nailed it. I yeah. think space simulations are, you know, even the demos we've seen, those are the most impressive and kind of taking you to that outworldly experience and giving you that sense of vertigo uh, that you want in, in VR. Uh, it's really impressive, especially when you're flying along like a big bridge, you know, a big ship, oh, capital yeah. ship, getting that scale uh, oh, yeah. and just kind of turning your head over and looking and then turning forward and you get that weird sense of speed. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be the coolest thing, I think. And also, it doesn't require you to move. Right. The only thing you'd need is like haptic gloves. Right. To like hit the buttons or whatever. But um, especially you racing it. games will be good with that too, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's right. true. But especially combining with like flight sticks. Like even a couple months ago, I brought home Colony Wars on PS1 and brought home like an old PS1 flight stick. And that was still like surprisingly immersive and <laughs> I really got into it. So combining that with a VR helmet would be awesome. But I'm still a bit of a skeptic when it comes to VR as far as walking around like i understand valve has their system where you can actually walk around the room but we all don't have that football stadium to play <laughs> yeah, VR in like people don't have enough room for connect and that's like four feet yeah just get a murphy bed make everything a murphy bed and it <laughs> collapses into the walls <laughs> perfect uh yeah but so i i don't know i'm skeptical about like you know call of duty and vr stuff like that like stuff where you're doing so much moving and you're not going to be just looking around trying to absorb in the experience at a pretty slow pace i don't think it's going to be very effective but yeah. i don't know I'm I'm excited to do stuff that kind of plays with perception, just like like I played a, a game at GDC where you're like it was a first person superhero thing. Okay, and I just felt really woozy after a while in a good way because you're flying, right? And I get like kind of weird sense that I wasn't in my body. So I want to see stuff where like you're at the top of some ridiculously high diving board. But how, what's the game? You know, 
Like that, just I a just bunch of explained the game. But you're at the top of a ridiculous. <laughs> but it's just you just want like a one for me. Do you want like Warrior Wear style like tech yes. demos, like different experiences, yep. rapid fire? That's what I want. That actually would be really cool. That yeah. would just be jumping awesome. between those. Warrior Wear VR. Yeah. Wow, that would be awesome. Uh, I thought you were going with the angle of Quirk with your ultimate fantasy of being a tiny little person in a big room. Oh god, little guy in a big world. Yeah, I would love that. That in VR. <laughs> yeah, like Toy Commander type. Yes. Or big wow. guy in a little world. Hey, I either or. Either one. <laughs> if I could be like a monster smash and stuff, yeah. uh, that'd be pretty sweet. Speaking of GDC, Let's uh, talk about we GDC. both played a game called Narcosis, which mm-hmm. is like, a, take like the Abyss and mix it with Amnesia, and mm-hmm. that's this this wow. sort of VR experience. And play, first time with like an Oculus, uh, you know, dev kit, the mm-hmm. second iteration. Yeah. Everything looked better. It was so, it's so unnerving to me. It's so rattling. And I... I love horror games, but it's almost getting like too real mm-hmm. to the point where like imagine playing PT or something like PT oh with that on. God. I don't even know if this is is this fun to any degree anymore. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I'm on board with that as much. I'll play it and I'll maybe I'll get used to it just like I got used to Resident Evil back then. But I think what I'm really excited for, um I don't know. I it's 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 really tricky, uh trying to like nail down what you think a genre would be. But like maybe something like Shadow of the Colossus, because it's really sure. good at portraying the sense of scale like relatable scale mm-hmm. and the idea of just like climbing something like a colossus and just having that sense of like oh my god i'm high up which would both be like man i'm nervous about falling because i could mm-hmm. die but mix it with like i've come a long way i think that that sense of scale and and and, and sort of distance could really sell some of those experiences it's a bummer that first person shot of the colossus is just gonna be look at that colossus fur <laughs> there look it at is. those yeah. mites yeah. right yeah. in his yeah. leg yeah. looks Cap- really cool haptic gloves to yeah. run your fingers Lice. through his grassy fur <laughs> But uh, yeah. By the way, uh, they they have to patch Morpheus support into PT, right? I mean, that's just a slam dunk. I mean, even with Kojima maybe being gone, that has to happen. Eighteen right? pages yeah. of health risk warnings and stuff. <laughs> like that. Uh, Good. My, my takeaway on VR uh, from GDC was a uh, pimple that I got right between my eyes because did you really of, from that superhero game? And Is it I don't think was... they were cleaning that mask enough. Oh, so, perfect. Yeah, it was super. But great. That's where your glasses are. No, it was like right. Oh, really? Perfect. <laughs> That's part of the experience. It's like a Cronenberg type expired <laughs> it's a body movie. Horror. Body horror. Yeah, yeah great. It's gonna be a perfect black fine hair that grows out of it. Anyway, yeah, so you'll be able to tell <laughs> who's been playing a lot of VR because they're just gonna have like this raccoon yes. eye of acne. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, so those were our those were the reader questions. They were awesome. Uh, there was a lot to choose from, but we want even more. So email your your questions to podcast at gameinformer.com. Again, question of the week. We'll we'll get a cool prize. We'll we'll loop back with Chris here. So thanks again, Chris. Uh, that was an awesome question. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. And stay tuned because up next we have the great Warren Spector talking about his career in games and a lot of fun secrets like the Command and Conquer RPG that he was pitching to EA and stuff like that that he's never really detailed before. So. Half-Life. Half-Life. Yeah, stay tuned, everybody. Welcome back to the Game Informer Show. Uh, we are honored this week to be joined by the great Warren Spector over Skype. Thank you so much, Warren. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm not sure about the great part, but thanks for the kind words. You don't feel like a legendary designer? Uh, I just feel like a guy who survived for 31 years, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> In the rough and tumble game industry? Yeah, you know, I've, I've always said it either keeps you young or kills you. And so far, uh, I think I'm lucky enough to be on the young side of that. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, if you don't know Warren Spector, which is impossible, but... He has been involved in developing games like Wing Commander, Ultima, Ultima Underworld, Thief, Deus Ex, Epic Mickey most recently. And what are you up to now, Warren? Uh, Right now, actually, I'm taking a little break from active development and uh, directing and teaching in uh, a program in game development here at the University of Texas uh, called the Denny Sam's Gaming Academy, uh, where... We're doing something a little different, actually. I know there are lots and lots of uh, programs out there teaching people how to make games, but we're focusing explicitly and exclusively on um, leadership and management, which is something that I think the game industry teaches very badly. It's all school of hard knocks stuff. And uh, I don't know of any other uh, educational institutions that are teaching it. So we're teaching people how to be creative leads, uh, producers, lead uh, programmers, lead artists, lead designers. Uh, and we're doing it in some unique ways, which I'm happy to talk about if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you don't need any like tech background to go into these programs. It's just all about leadership. Oh, well, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're uh, only accepting 20 students 
uh, just as a side note, we're we're not charging tuition and we're paying a ten thousand dollars stipend to each student. Oh wow! Um, but the way we're structuring it is there's an hour and a half of class time in the morning where we're giving you tools and concepts, uh, the the ins and outs of leadership from the perspective of real working game developers. Uh, but in the afternoon and and evenings, uh, those twenty students are all working on one big game for nine months. So uh, we needed to build a team, and we need to build a team uh, for next year. We're already accepting applications for next year. Um, but what we need is a, a good balance of programmers and artists and designers so we can build a team to build what you know we, we hope will be maybe not a professional game, but definitely not a student game. We're kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, and we're wrapping up the first year, and it's been pretty exciting. That's really cool. Was your involvement in that program a response to any of the current trends in how you know game development's handled? You know, it's it's been a response to the way the game industry has worked in the entire time I've been in it. Uh, like I said, we we just do such a bad job in the game business, uh, whether that's on the mainstream side or on the indie side of of training our next generation of leaders. Uh, and so I saw a, a need and uh, just decided that uh, this was the opportunity to fill it. Do you think that's because of the roots of the gaming industry, or is it common across all media that just being a creative leader is difficult? I think it starts uh, in all media as, as kind of the standard thing. You know, when, when the movies started and when TV started, there was no way to, to study. You just had to learn by doing everything. But over time, I mean, if you look at the movies now, uh, most people making movies didn't come up through the ranks. They actually did get a degree of some kind in, in radio, TV, film. Uh, and I think the game industry is finally maturing and growing up enough that, you know, we, we can't start teaching. We have people who have enough experience that we can help some of the, the younger folks who want to get into the game business uh, or who want to run, run their own indie studios. We can help them not make the same mistakes we did. Sure. So what are some of the big questions that the students these days have for you? Oh man, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, it's amazing what these uh, these folks are coming in not knowing. Uh, they're they're certainly uh, intensely interested in the different ways you can structure a team. They're intensely interested in the uh, the different ways you can um, manage a project, a schedule, a budget. Uh, they're very interested in how do you actually pitch a game, uh, and who is the typical audience for a pitch? How do you get funding? Uh, we've even had to go into how do you run a meeting? No one teaches you how to run a meeting or how to postmortem a project. So uh, the range of things we're teaching is pretty broad. And we're kind of taking a boot camp approach because uh, a lot of people have told me you can't teach leadership. And I just think they're nuts because you look at the military. They're doing a pretty good job of teaching leaders, and we, we hope they're doing a good job anyway. Uh, and so we're taking this boot camp approach where we're throwing them in and when they fail, which inevitably they will, running a team of 20 people is rough. And so when they run into problems, we can sort of say, hey, wait, hold on, let's take a look at what just happened. Uh, because in an educational setting, failure is a, a teaching moment. Whereas in the game business, in the real world, failure is a firing moment, right? So we want them to make their mistakes here at the Denny Sam's Gaming Academy and not when they're working for uh, one of the big publishers or when they're trying to run their own business. So which project from your past do you think you took the biggest leap in in terms of your leadership skills? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, certainly uh, my my earliest projects when I was working with Richard Garriott on Ultima 6 and with Paul Nurath on Space Rogue and Chris Roberts on Wing Commander, uh, I very quickly learned I knew nothing. Even though I've been making tabletop games for six or seven years, I, I knew nothing. So I was in full-on learn-everything-I-can mode from those guys. Uh, when I started working with the Looking Glass team on Underworld was the moment where I, I really started putting lessons into practice. So that was probably a turning point for me. Uh, and it's been a learning process ever since. I, I you know, every project is different. Every team is different. And I, I just keep making different mistakes, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're also involved in Underworld Ascendant to some degree now, right? Yeah. I'm uh, advising them on uh, mostly the creative side uh, because, you know, I was involved in the original and in Underworld 2 uh, as a producer and sort of person who gave creative input and, and uh, managed the team at various points. Uh, and 
you know, I look back on Underworld and remember the first time I saw the tech demo uh, that Paul Nurath put together. And I just remember looking at that thinking, the world just changed. It was the very first fully textured, real-time, 3D, first-person thing and anybody in the world had ever seen. And so uh, that project, in a, in a very real sense, changed the world. I mean, uh, most people nowadays just look at first-person shooters or first-person stealth games or whatever and think, oh, yeah, that's just the way games are. But they're building on a foundation that, that Underworld set. And what I want to do uh, with the Ascendant team and for the Ascendant team is make sure they stay true to that spirit of of changing the world because I think there's still plenty of change the game industry needs uh, and the the medium the art form needs in order to reach full maturity. So I just want to make sure they uh, they they go out there with the mindset of changing the world again. So do you call in every once in a while, or what does that consulting actually look like? Yeah, we do we do Skype. There's a lot of email. Uh, there's a lot of uh, evaluating artwork and design documents uh, over uh, over box. Uh, you know, there are lots of teams that work in a distributed manner, and that's kind of the way uh, we're doing it now. Uh, but I'm providing whatever input I can and hope it's useful to them. Definitely. Can we go back and talk a little bit about some turning points in your career? When you had a, sure. a fork in the road, you could go one way or go another. Um, I don't know if you remember, but years ago, you are showing off Epic Mickey 2 here, and you joined us on a replay of Deus Ex, and it was fascinating. I recommend if you're a Deus Ex fan, go back and watch it. It's like you're never going to get more direct insight into the development of Deus Ex than that. Um, but... In that replay, you mentioned that uh, right before Ion Storm, you were about to sign a deal with EA to make a Command & Conquer RPG? Yeah, uh, it, it, it was pretty strange the way everything worked out. Um, I, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a point where uh, I wrote an article. Of, I can't believe they ran the whole thing because it was pretty long, uh, called Role Playing for the, the 21st Century. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can still find it online. Uh, where I just sort of outlined what I thought needed to happen for the medium to take its next steps and for role-playing to, to really focus on the role part, R-O-L-E, and not the role part, R-O-L-L. Um, so I wrote that article and really wanted to put my money where my mouth was and, and make a game that expressed all of the things that I talked about there. Uh, and when I left Origin, I had nothing. I mean, I didn't have a team. I didn't have any money. Uh, and so I, I went out pitching a game that uh, I thought would express all those ideas. And one of the people I talked to, one of the companies I talked to was Electronic Arts, uh, Westwood in particular. Uh, and they were thinking about taking the world of Command & Conquer out of the RTS space and doing a role-playing game set in that incredibly rich world. And so my original plan was to do all the Deus ex -y stuff in the context of Command & Conquer. Uh, but there was... You know, talk about a turning point. There was a moment where I, I had the contract on my desk, and this is literally true. The pen was poised over the contract, and I was about to sign it when I got a phone call uh, from John Romero up in Dallas. And he said, uh, I want you to join Ion Storm. Uh, and I just I said, John, it's it's too late. I can't. I'm about to sign this contract. I need the deal. And he said, don't sign that contract. I'm driving down to Austin tomorrow, and I'm going to change your mind. And he, you know, rolled up in his enormous Hummer and, <laughs> came, and, and came and talked to me and said, make the game of your dreams with no creative interference and the biggest marketing budget you've ever had and the biggest development budget. And, you know, who, who says no to that? And so I took the leap. I said, okay, Ion Storm is kind of a a new thing, but no creative interference, uh, big budget. Yeah, I'm in. So uh, that's that's why I signed on with Iron Storm and why there isn't, uh, at least from me, a Command & Conquer role-playing game nowadays. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, Westwood was going to take that leap before Blizzard in a way with, I mean, obviously it wasn't an MMORPG like World of Warcraft, but just trying to take that RTS and blow it out with some more RPG mechanics. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because uh, after Origin, I actually went to Looking Glass uh, as a full-time guy running uh, an Austin studio, which I built up from, from scratch. And the project we were working on was an MMO. Uh, I, I looked at the MMOs that were out there at the time and just thought, wow, these guys are doing it all wrong. I just, I can't, I can't imagine that this is the right thing or the end for uh, the end goal of, of MMOs. And so I was working on an MMO for Looking Glass called, strangely enough, Junction Point. Uh, and uh, 
to this day, people have come close to executing against what we were talking about doing, but there's a 200 page design document that that would still actually be doing things that no one's done in the MMO space. Uh, so who knows, maybe someday I'll do that. It's so tough to like bring your model of, you know, player actions having consequences into the world of an MMO, though, that seems to be the complete opposite of what an MMO is all about. Yeah, well, that's the complete opposite of what MMOs are about nowadays and have been for, for many years. Uh, but I just never thought it made sense for, uh, you know, people. It, OK, I'm going to overstate to make my case, but it sure. never seemed sensible to me to have people waiting in line to kill a dragon and then wait for that dragon to to uh, reappear. So the next person in line could go kill it and then next person, then the next person. Uh, so I wanted to find a way uh, to support uh, something very different and something much more story oriented, but still something that allowed small groups of players to go out and have uh, some impact on the way the story unfolded uh, and then basically leave those small group instances to come back into a massive uh, shared world, the, the junction point of all worlds, where what they did, they could talk about what they did and where what they did in their small group adventure their story adventure, where that could really materially affect the way the world uh, unfolded in that massive, uh, massively multiplayer area. Um, there, I mean, it was a 200-page design document, sure. so I'm not going to explain the whole thing here. In a, in <laughs> sure, you have it on your desk. Interview, yeah. But uh, it was it was still going to be pretty cool, and I'd still love to try that someday. Yeah. Well, speaking of Junction Point, do you want to just talk about the earliest days of that studio? Yeah, sure. Um the, it, again, I have to go back to, uh, well, not Looking Glass. I won't go back that far. But uh, Ion Storm uh, grew to be 90 or 100 people. And uh, we, we were starting to work on the third Deus Ex game. Uh, and, you know, I just looked at that and said, this is too big. Uh, I do. I really want to do a third game in this this same universe. I mean, I, I had some ideas about what we would do, and certainly the team had very different, but still very cool ideas about what we could do in a third Deus Ex game. But I just wanted to, you know, start over from scratch uh, and see what a smaller team could could do. And so I left, uh, leaving Ion Storm in very good hands and and in pretty good shape. I thought, but I left with. Uh, a fellow named Art Min, who was a programmer at Looking Glass, a uh, great producer. Uh, and we built a small team. We had like half a dozen people. Uh, we put together three uh, pitches. We put together one uh, epic role-playing game, fantasy role-playing game called Sleeping Giants, where we had a whole world worked out. Um, we, we wanted to do that kind of um, shared authorship game that I, that, that I think is so important. Uh, enormous dragons returning to a world where magic is is uh, ebbing and co but coming back. Uh, I, I I look at you know Dragon Age and some of the other games uh, recently and think, damn it, I could have been first. Uh, <laughs> dragons, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, I, you know it's okay. So it's not the most original idea, but <laughs> we were going to do a, a thing about elemental magic where what you did really affected not just the story but also the look and shape and feel of the world. We had working prototypes. Anyway, we did that. Uh, I was also working with John Wu, the film director, mm -hmm. uh, on a concept called Necessary... I'm sorry, that's the other one. Uh, called um, uh, Ninja Gold, which is going to be, again, the same kind of game because I'm kind of a Johnny OneNote. I, I know what I <laughs> like and, and I'm going to try to keep doing it better every, every chance I get. But Ninja Gold was about modern-day ninjas... Uh, deciding what's right and wrong, allying yourself with different factions. Uh, and uh, that one went pretty far. Again, we, uh, we had a deal. We had a movie deal at the same time. Wow. Uh, would, have been, would have been pretty cool. Uh, John was going to direct it. Uh, the game? The movie. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. I was going to do the game. He was going to do the movie. We created the world and the characters and the, the, uh, the story together. Uh, so that was one that, that, that we created in the early days of Junction Point. I understand and then, the, the name. Then Necessary Evil, because uh, I thought that the Deus Ex conspiracy thing, you know, was was getting kind of old. It was very much a millennial idea, and we were well past the, the turn of the millennium. And so I started looking around at 
uh, what I thought the next step would be in terms of um, that human augmentation and what does it mean to be human, uh, that, that concept. And so I, I kind of filed the serial numbers off Deus Ex and created a new world. So I went out pitching those three things and um, got, got a deal for Sleeping Giants. That deal went away in the way that deals do. I got another deal. That deal went away. Um, so uh, uh, Valve actually stepped in and, and saved us, frankly. We were doing some concept development for them for a year, maybe even two while at the same time I was doing concept development for uh, Disney on what became Epic Mickey. So um, it was it was pretty exciting. I mean, doing a startup is is always like jumping off a cliff and I had to pay payroll out of my pocket for a while. Oh, you know, man. it was it was pretty crazy. But the, yeah. the core of that team stayed with me and uh, we ultimately ended up doing some pretty cool stuff with Disney. Nice. So like you're juggling a lot of plates. Right before Ben asks the next question, next question I understand the name... Uh, sleeping giants in sort of the context of a fantasy world, but how'd you land on the name Ninja Gold? <laughs> uh, it was it was just something that John and I came up All with. Right. I, I really don't even remember. It was I mean the story was was about um, a, a group of of uh, Japanese uh, criminals, you know, basically the yakuza and the ninjas sort of at odds with each other over South African gold. I mean, okay. I, I'm kind of a nut for research and realism. So everything in Ninja Gold came out of uh, real world events and, and things that actually were happening in the news. Uh, and at that time, there was um, a whole big thing about South African gold going missing. And I said, hey, nobody really knows what really happened there. Let's make something up. And so Ninja Gold seemed like the right answer. The hero was a ninja gold disappearing was the heart of the story. So Ninja Gold. Putting ninjas in there was a good idea. Yeah, it's a good yeah. name. So what does concept development with Valve look like from your perspective? Is it just a uh, long iterative process? Yeah, it was it was fairly iterative. They 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 left us alone more than I expected. Um, but uh, we were working on, I, I don't know how much I can say about this even now, uh, but what, what are they going to do? Say you'll never work in the game business again? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, we were working on an episode. They were really into episodic uh, content at that point. And we were working on an episode that would fill in one of the gaps in the, the Half-Life story. Uh, and, and so we were trying to flesh out a specific part of Half-Life, of the world of Half-Life. And we created a new tool, uh, a thing uh, we elegantly called the Magnet Gun, which I still wish they would do something with. We came up with so many cool ways to use a magnet gun that were completely different and uh, from anything they had done and was really uh, free form in its use. Uh, I still think it would be cool. But uh, when when the deal with, uh, with Disney really started to bear fruit, um, I, I just couldn't say no to, to Disney. I'd, I'd always wanted to work there. And so... Uh, we never completed the work with Valve. So we can blame Mickey Mouse for episode three not coming out? Uh, I Maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I think Valve was rethinking their episodic plan anyway, but uh, certainly the, the choice. I mean, when, when you have the opportunity to work with the most, most recognizable icon on planet Earth, Anybody who says no to that is nuts, and uh, I'm not I'm not that nuts in that way. <laughs> so the magnet gun, I mean, that almost sounds like a precursor to what ended up being the gravity gun. And well, this would have been after episode. It was. Oh, yeah, it would it have been was a continuation. Yeah, gun. that's right. So it's interesting considering or like trying to think of what a magnet gun could have done differently in that, yeah, that universe. It would have it would have complemented the the gravity gun uh, pretty nicely, I think. Just be Magneto, essentially. That'd be that sounds alright. <laughs> so uh, going into the Disney era. Since you're such a Disney nerd, I'm a bit of a Disney nerd. Uh, what was the most satisfying moment of working within Disney, like going through the archives and stuff like that? Well, the most satisfying moment was the realization that we were bringing Oswald the Lucky Rabbit back to Disney. There, there. Were, I mean, there was a very specific moment where where the magic happened for me. Uh, we were working on the intro sequence, uh, and there's a little moment where a door opens just a little bit and this this cartoon rabbit sticks his head through the the little opening in the door and i just the hair stood on end for me i mean my hair is standing on end right now even thinking about it that was the first time oswald had been seen in a disney story since 1928 and the opportunity to do that was 
it, it was mind blowing. So that was that was pretty much the moment for me. Uh, the 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 most uh, significant moment for me. And then, do, are they still using Oswald now? Is he at like Walt Disneyland as a as somebody in a suit, or what are they doing with that character now? Well, it's Disney, so there's certainly a lot of Oswald merchandise out there now. Sure. Uh, and there is a costumed character, so if you want Oswald's autograph, you, you can go get it. And there's uh, Oswald's filling station uh, in uh, in the park. Uh, so he's he's pretty well represented. I, I wish there was even more of him. I, I'd love to see a, a series of cartoons. Uh, in fact, I pitched a series of cartoons featuring Mickey and Oswald, uh, but it didn't quite work out. You know, I mean, Disney has a lot, uh, going on and that was not something they wanted to support at that time. But, but it's interesting because they went back and they did those old style, uh, 2d Mickey cartoons again. So it seems like Oswald could have been kind of slid into there pretty easily. Yeah. I, I, I would personally want to see a more traditional look for Oswald cartoons, but I just want to see him anywhere. That, that little guy is a terrific actor and deserves even better than he's had so far. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the whole Disney experience in retrospect? Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, I mean, it, it, I don't know about other people, but I, I long ago made what I hate to call it that, but I, I, I made up a bucket list, you know, uh, and uh, one of the things that was on there was I'm going to work for Disney uh, in some capacity. I'm going to make cartoons or I'm going to be an Imagineer, but I'm going to damn well work for Disney. Uh, and that opportunity was pretty special. Um, you know, when I, I told my mom that I was working for Disney, she didn't say congratulations or are you crazy? She said it's about time. <laughs> uh, oh, so wow. li- living out a dream was really special. Uh, you mentioned the archives a little while ago, getting to dig around in the archives and, and getting to know the people who are as crazy about Disney as you are. And as I are, uh, I am, I are, geez. um, <laughs> But getting to, to root around in the archives and, you know, just go in and say, hey, can you show me everything you have uh, on Alice in Wonderland, for example, and having them just laugh and laugh and laugh because they have so much. Uh, or going into the Imagineering archive and um, them apologizing for me because at the time they only had 90,000 images uh, and documents scanned. Oh, my God. Jeez. Yeah, only 90,000. <laughs> uh, so... That was another high point, the uh, the archives, yeah. certainly. I'm, I'm curious what you think of Disney's current uh, Disney Infinity initiative and how they've kind of trimmed all console development down to just Disney Infinity. You know, honestly, I'm disappointed because I think uh, there are lots of ways to support the Disney characters, uh, not just in that one context. Uh, so I, I just frankly wish there was uh, more of a commitment to to what you might call mainstream gaming, but there's certainly a lot going on in mobile, uh, you know, which is very cool. I, you know, if, if I, if I, uh, do get back into, uh, making games, if this teaching thing doesn't work out, um, you know, if, if I do, uh, the mobile space is really intriguing. And so I'm glad that Disney is, is focusing on that pretty, pretty heavily. Definitely. Uh, and I know you're a big DuckTales fan and I wanted uh. to get your take on the return of DuckTales on TV. Uh, I'm totally psyched, man. I hope they do a great job. Uh, I remember watching the original series and just thinking uh, two things, actually. Man, the animation in this is way better than anybody else is doing. So I hope they they live up to that standard and and actually exceed it. Uh, And also, holy cow, that story is adapted from a Carl Barks comic book from 1950. That's amazing. Um, So I I hope they do it justice. And and the other thing is, you know, I wrote... um, a four-issue arc of DuckTales uh, a couple of years ago and helped plot the first DuckTales Darkwing Duck crossover series. And uh, if anybody's out there listening, man, would I love to write some more comics. I mean, writing (laughs) DuckTales would be awesome, but uh, just writing comics was a ton of fun. So uh, get in touch with me and I'll happily write some comics for you, (laughs) whoever you are. So we have a lot of Game Informer um, people here that are big fans of DuckTales too, but just as a quick note, how do you keep Huey, Dewey, and Louie apart? I, as big of a fan as I am, I can't, I can't manage that. Yeah, well, uh, you look at the color of their hats. <laughs> yeah, Tim, uh, come on. And you, uh, you use Wikipedia a lot. <laughs> uh, even when I was writing those comics, I was having trouble keeping them apart. Uh, but they do actually have somewhat distinct personalities, 
Uh, you know, one is more leaderly, one is right. more curious, one is more adventurous, uh, you know, so they have slightly different personalities. Um, and uh, I, I love the fact that at least sometimes they finish each other's sentences. I find that really amusing. It's great. Uh, but you, you look it up a lot. Uh Ben was telling me, I, I was out of the office when you came by the last time we mentioned it was for Epic Mickey 2, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you guys mm-hmm. went, on, you went on replay and everything. And he told me the story about you, you guys started in on DuckTales and you ran to go grab your laptop and busted it open and started playing uh, game music. I'm assuming it was the moon theme from DuckTales that you were probably blaring or something from the NES game. But uh, I was, it was. <laughs> I want to know how big of a, a video game music fan you are. I'm a huge game music fan myself. And I'm just kind of curious about your, your interest in that. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan, but I know my blood pressure goes down every time I hear the Zelda theme. Okay. Uh, you know, and I, I have a fair amount of game music uh, in my iTunes library, but uh, that's uh, that's not an area where I geek out as much as some other people. Okay, gotcha. Um, so kind of transitioning away from, from some of the, the past a little bit, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on you know, just taking your experience in the game industry, uh, which is a lot, but, you know, between places like, you know, Looking Glass and Junction Point uh, and Ion Storm, where have you found it is like the sweet spot for development size? And I guess now with your teaching, you're kind of uh, even consi- like putting that under the microscope even more, but where do you feel like the team, the team size sweet spot is? Well, there are, there are certainly um, levels at which culture changes. Uh, and, Usually not for the better. Uh, you know, up to if if you can do a game with with four of your buddies, more power to you. That's that's just kind of a magical experience. Uh, when I started, actually, uh, teams were you know ten, twelve, thirteen people, uh, and we thought that was hard to manage at the time. Boy, were we wrong. Uh, in retrospect, that was easy, and it 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 felt pretty good uh, for me. Uh, the sweet spot would be about 25. That's okay. that's the point at which uh, you know, team dynamics become interesting and sometimes difficult. Uh, and you end up not liking the person sitting next to you and you get varying levels of skill in different areas and you, you kind of start thinking about specialization. Uh, and that was, that was about where we were on Deus Ex. We had uh, 34 people, including our test, um, test team, and that that felt pretty good. Uh, and when I started Junction Point, boy, isn't this funny in retrospect. Uh, when I started Junction Point, my plan was to get to about 25, uh, which is big enough to build out um, not a vertical slice, much more than a vertical slice, but a sort of a canonical uh, level in a game or a canonical part of a game that would literally be the game you want to ship but only a small part of it. And then I was going to farm out uh, everything else to other partners because I okay. found lots of partners who were capable of doing so much more than just artwork. Uh, they could actually uh, execute against a game and we would give them the model uh, and obviously uh, give them the overall design and the overall storyline and make sure they understood all that choice and consequence stuff that is going to be a part of everything I ever do. Um, and we would critique their work and all, but I, I think for me, 25 is about the right number, but you know, I mean, I've done, I've done 90 person teams. I've I've, at junction point when we shut down, we had 200 people. Uh, and if you look at everybody who touched Epic Mickey two, it's 800 people touched that game. I will never do that again <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really interesting you know and and you know talking about like the industry now I'm curious I don't know how much time you've had to, to keep on keep up on games as a teacher I'm sure that's keeps you really really busy but w- what are some of the standout narratives from from modern games that have stuck with you from things that you've maybe played uh, in the last couple of years well it's it's interesting because um, as a developer, there's a certain kind of game. I mean, if you look at all of the games I've worked on, there's a certain kind of game that I make and I want to make, and it's the only kind of game I want to make. From the earliest Ultima games I worked on up to Epic Mickey 2, it's all about uh, allowing players to create their own unique experiences uh, in collaboration with me and with my teams. So we kind of share authorship is the way the way I describe it. 
but as a player, uh, the most satisfying narratives for me have been very different. Uh, I, I was, I, I almost hate to admit this. Uh, I was such a huge fan of, uh, of heavy rain. Uh, I really enjoyed because it rain. did tell wonderful, a wonderful story, you know? Uh, I was a huge fan and, and remain a huge fan of what telltale is doing. Um, but the, the thing is, uh, I, I mean, no offense and there's no judgment in what I'm about to say, but, those guys are making pick a path books with pretty pictures. Right. And when you're doing that, you're completely in control of the experience. Uh, and, and so you can tell a great story. Telling stories in a cinematic way is kind of a solved problem. And so of course you can tell a great story, uh, in, in more traditional games. Um, you know, I, I, what I do is I play a little bit of a lot of games. I play until I either get bored senseless uh, or I feel like I've learned everything the game is going to teach me. I finish very, very few games. Uh, and I just haven't seen anything that, that makes me go, wow, these guys are advancing the state of the art in, in storytelling. I, I mean, literally nothing. Okay. I'm curious if I made a lot of buzz last year, but I'm curious if you played Shadow of Mordor, the Lord of the Rings game that Monolith made. I'm actually uh, playing that right now. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, I think they're doing some interesting stuff. I still haven't gotten to the point where I'm seeing a great narrative, but everybody assures me it's there. So I will I will continue playing that. I think mainly people just like the Nemesis system and building up kind of those rivalries. You know, no, yeah. nothing that elaborate really comes out of it, but just I think people were wowed by how personalized that can feel. That that certainly is the thing that uh, that I've noticed that I, 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 can, cert- I can say... Well, you know, I've never seen that. That's cool. Mm-hmm. It's good that people are still doing things that that you've never seen. Um, one of my ro- my rules, I got a whole lot of rules that I, I always impose on teams. Uh, you know, they're, they're, I call them my commandments. Uh, and one of them is uh, we're still a young enough medium that every game must include at least one thing no one in the world has ever seen or done before. It's still, I don't want to say trivial, but it is still relatively simple to include one thing, even if you're making a licensed game or a, you know, uh, game X number 72, you can still find one thing that advances the state of the art just a, just a little bit, you know? And so it's Shadow of Mortar, you know, certainly I have never seen anything like that. So, you know, good on them. Yeah, definitely. I'm also curious because last time we spoke to you, it was before Dishonored came out. I know you worked with Harvey Smith. Uh, quite a bit in the Deus Ex series. Uh, did you ever get around to playing Dishonored? Did you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, I love Dishonored. Uh, it's it's very much the kind of game that I like making. Uh, you know, uh, half the team uh, worked with me on on Deus Ex sure. and at at Ion Storm, and uh, you know, it's it's nice to see the torch being carried by by all those young whippersnappers. You know, it <laughs> it, it gives me hope for the the future of that kind of game. Definitely. And I know you're running short on time, but I'm just curious, uh, do you see game development in your future at any point again? You know, you never want to say never. Uh, I, uh, I'm certainly enjoying the teaching right now, and uh, I've reached a point in my life and my career where uh, helping other people achieve their goals uh, and trying to convince them that uh, the way I think about development and design is, is uh, if not the way to go, a way to go. <laughs> I'm enjoying that right now. Uh, and, but I certainly have some things I'd still like to do in development. So, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Cool. All right. Well, we'll let you get back to teaching. I know you have a meeting coming up, but we cannot thank you enough, Warren. Really appreciate your time. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me the time. And I really hope to see that magnet gun in action someday. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) That'd be great. (laughs) Call up Doug Church, man. Get on it. Uh, I, I talk to Doug pretty regularly. He's, uh, He's still the secret master of gaming for me, and so uh, help me make him famous. I've been trying for uh, 25 years and not successfully. Why so doesn't he get out a, there? It's up to you. All right. Make it happen. He's tough to get a hold of, but we'll try our best, Warren. All, All right. right. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Good thank thanks. you for tuning in to the first episode of the kind of rebooted Game Informer show. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave comments below in the story or send an email to podcast at gameinformer.com, and we'll read every single one. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thanks. See ya.